to see where um, my presentation is open, but I cannot pick it up if I want to share. Just check where I can find it quickly. It might be under it tends don't to waste be, your time. No, it might be under the tends to bundle all of the things you can share under one corner. So if you click on that, it should open them up. Let's see where um, my presentation is open, but I cannot pick it up. Yeah, so when you click on, on share, if I want to share, under that window, and then a number of things underneath there, and then it, you can choose what you check want to share. I can find it quickly. Um, I'm at that one chair, but now my presentation I cannot find. That's now uh, technology. If I want to share, uh, should I maybe um, ask Mr. Matiafa to share? Perhaps if we, yeah, if you can share it, then it's fine. Then we can start, Jay. All right. Uh, Mr. Matiaha, can we assist, please, sir? Or Mr. Lamine? I'll ask Mr. Matiaha to assist, sir. Okay, please. Uh, Jay, um, I found it, so I might be able to share it from my side. Okay, please go ahead. Thank you. We can, we can, yeah, it's beginning to show. Yep, it's showing yeah. now. Thank you. You can proceed. So can you see it? Yes, we can. So your 20 minutes starts now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, Jay, once again, uh, uh, Arty, good morning to you and the committee members. And uh, from Agri Racing Cape side, um, thank you very much for, uh, for the opportunity to do this presentation today. Uh, I want to start off to saying it, it's it, it, it's quite a daunting task to to evaluate um, the whole uh, document and, and and the proposed uh, changes in in the price determination um, or tariff determination. But uh, yeah, we've tried our best to to make comments and and we also forwarded our our written comments uh, to the committee. And uh, this will be just a short presentation on on. Uh, our answers on on the major questions that that has been asked. Okay, just to um, start off, uh, our, uh, just what I'll be focusing on is who is Agri Western Cape, um, the background, uh, elements shaping our commentary, and then also the stakeholder questions as I've referred to it. Just in short, Chair. Um, you're probably familiar with Agri Western Cape, but let's just touch in short what, what we do and what we focus on. We are uh, apolitical, uh, and I think um, that's important to understand, federal and a voluntary member-based organization and representing in the Western Cape around about 3,500 commercial farmers. Uh, we have uh, 92 farmer unions or agricultural organizations affiliated with us which also includes some of the uh, major commodity organizations. Um, and I think that will be, uh, it's important to, to understand uh, the representation uh, because uh, our province is probably the most diverse province in terms of uh, agricultural enterprises. So very reliant on, on sustainable energy supply uh, because of our intensive um, dependence on, on, on irrigation uh, and, and, and cold storage because we're working with a lot of perishable products as well. So, Chair, our core purpose is uh, to create a conducive policy environment for the primary agriculture sector. So, and that's why we, we, I would like to thank you to do this presentation again this morning, um, uh, to give inputs uh, to, uh, in our opinion and view, to the benefit of, of our members. So, just uh, uh, some background, like I've referred to the irrigation and, and very high value crops that we've got in our province um, and, and, and the absolute reliance on uh, sustainable supply of electricity. Um, and not only in the primary part or section of, of production, but also throughout the, the food value chain. And uh, then uh, it, it, uh, the supply and the cost of electricity uh, is a prominent determinant 
of, of our profitability or the farmer's profitability. Uh, uh, in your document, there's also been referral to, to the um, consumption or the usage from the agricultural sector and the mining sector and so forth. And unfortunately, we've also seen that, that decline um, in the usage from the agriculture sector. So, and we as a sector, uh, we're extremely low, uh, have a low price el uh, elasticity. Um, and that's yeah, just indicative of uh, perhaps a captured market in terms of the short term um, that we at this stage, although there's uh, options of alternative energy, but uh, quite uh, uh, reliant on, 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 on ESCOM's provision of, of electricity to the sector. Yeah, just to um, highlight some of the elements that uh, shaped our commentary and that uh, is also referred to in your document, but we would like to highlight that we took uh, notice of uh, is the increasing price uh, uh, prices result in, in the loss of electricity sales. As I've mentioned, uh, uh, that table that's been uh, produced in, in, in your document, uh, your consultation document and, and leading to sales. Or, or, or sales leading to a possible uh, utility death spiral, as as uh, to to use the words in as in your document. Uh, so not a very healthy situation, and and therefore also supporting uh, that we need to address um, uh, if it's the method the tariff uh, determination uh, methodology, uh, we we should uh, uh, contribute and as uh, and try and and assist in 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 bettering it. Future prices to be based on predictable methodology. It's important that will yield predictable uh, prices and cost ref, uh, reflectivity. And it's also important for us in our planning um, ahead uh, to 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 have a more uh, predictable price uh, increase or or yeah. You know, I don't foresee decreases, but most probably increases for budgeting purposes. Uh, regulating revenues resulted in an uh, untenable or unsustainable situation and will be abandoned in its current format. Uh, the new approach will consumer uh, focused, uh, which I personally uh, like very much. Um, and I'll touch on, 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 the, on, the, on the three principles uh, just a little bit later then. Um, the poor performance of the electricity industry is driving a crisis, and we all know that. We don't need to explain that, and it's 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 really a concern for us as a sector uh, uh, um, at this stage. And then the principles of the Electricity Electricity Regulation Act uh, to be adhered to, and will include cost recovery, etc. Um, that I don't want to dwell on. So, Chair, what we understand is just. Um, uh, uh, you've mentioned uh, in, in your consultation document as well to the, the duck curve. And uh, I think this is um, what, what is what is in, uh, positive for me personally as well, is that we try with um, the recommendations to meet the supply and the demand needs. And I think that is that is important. And like those three principles uh, highlighted, the supply, the demand and the uh, demand and then the cost reflective uh, uh, to be reflective of co uh, consumer prices. So I think that's if we can merge those three principles, I think that um, we, we will definitely have a positive impact uh, on the way forward. Okay, I'm going to just run, uh, I'm just watching my time as well, uh, through the, the major questions. Um, uh, so uh, please bear with me, but I'm not going to elaborate on, on each one. It's in our document as well, and uh, um, and we will also accommodate any questions and, and answer in writing uh, should the need be. So on, on, on question one, uh, we have the opinion that unbundling is, in our opinion, a legal imperative. So regarding the act that's stated there, that's been stated there, um, and then also paramount to the, determine the appropriate circumstances under which uh, those surcharges uh, can be uh, 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 allocated for. The segregation of cost in determining prudency with a view of efficiency uh, should not be negotiable. Um, uh, that's very important. Surcharges directly or indirectly based on, on cost structures can only happen if there's proper uh, unbundling, as also uh, mentioned in, in, in your document, the consultation document. On question two, um, the profit determination mechanism proposed by NERSA and, and proposed alternative mechanisms, uh, we also agree that the revenue requirement methodology to remain 
uh, is the world acceptable methodology um, for regulation of tariffs. <clears throat> the proposed methodology, the intention to analyze and applying cost elements is, is a more focused manner. Um, revenue determination still preferred, uh, uh, but a currently limited uh, deviation from what is currently available. Prudency and usable assets and return on assets should be focused on um, uh, in, in determining um, the prices there. On, on uh, uh, continue on, on question two, the, uh, we also said that the, despite firmer hand on, on operational cost and asset utilization, um, your weighted uh, average cost of capital uh, will remain um, and, and, and in very important. And then also, um, to the regulate uh, the RIB regulatory uh, asset base uh, must represent assets used and usable to provide services will require extensive analysis of assets owned some assets we know become uh, or became absolute at this stage plants which were uh, mothballed should not be according to us part of the the RAB Further to continue, accumulated provision for depreciation essentially represent the reserve fund for future capital replacement. That's important, and we've mentioned in previous uh, comments as well um, that it's important that that depreciation be allocated for uh, a replacement of, 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 uh, of capital items in the future. So Aggie Wisdom Cape concurs with NASA that the historical cost base should be used and for the reasons that the replacement value of capital stock owned by um, ISCOM is difficult to be determined uh, given the age of some of the assets and the dynamics uh, pertaining the, uh, to technology um, and, and, and it's complicated matching uh, of the assets uh, for purpose of using replacement value and depreciation. Chair on question three. And yeah, and I apologize uh, for running uh, at, at the right now because I'm just watching the time guiding light. Uh, uh, well, it's, it's with regards to the quest, uh, the data intensiveness and the purpose solution of our licenses can be assisted to be compliant. Uh, the guiding light for us is for data intensiveness is what is required by the regulator to execute its mandate. Legal obligation on licensees uh, to provide information according to section 45. And proposed solution is provide guidance, for example, training and information on verification processes that will ensure accuracy, legal action against non-compliance. We need to follow that route eventually should they not comply and public or putting public licenses under administration. And then also um, the timeframes, the data will be collected uh, and submitted to NERSA every five years as per your document. Um, we failed to understand the specific time period as it bears no relationship to the medium or annual budgets and, and, uh, and the period seems to be too long uh, given the volatility of the electricity industry. And I think further down in our questions, we also refer to perhaps or recommend an annual um, uh, period so that we can uh, address or better budget in, in terms of our sector. So um, the comments on the role of the energy and the consumer load profiles, uh, uh, I must say I find the load profiles quite interesting and I will refer to it later as well. It's a hybrid of loads may be uh, present uh, in the sector due to divergent use, example, for example, irrigation, household use, cold chain. So um, we would just like to have some clarity on, on where on what load uh, the, uh, the, the short term or the ad hoc uh, uh, um, load category. Um, hybrid use, uh, as explained in 4A, uh, may require further category unless the uh, proposed load aggregation methodology provides sufficient uh, to include the agriculture sector. Clarity um, or specific needs uh, that should be addressed is uh, clarity should be provided as to how the load approach will be applied in rural areas um, in general and the agriculture sector in, partic in particular in those rural areas then. Are not regulated. Um, we, it might be set uh, arbitrarily and, and, and probably too, too high, uh, given the uh, monopolistic elements in so the cost can be determined as prudent and realistic. Uh, do we agree with the move from regulating revenue to regulate prices, regulating revenue at, at legal suppliers to reduce costs likely more to be uh, than the regulated prices? <clears throat> But yeah, however, given the, the, the RCA history in South Africa, uh, regulating prices might be uh, a better option, especially for new entrants into the industry, uh, supply industry. 
uh, with uh, subsidies. I'm not going to elaborate too much on it, but it should be set uh, on cost uh, reflective prices. Um, and then, um, do you have anything to add to analysis? The application of the new methodology and data uh, obtained will in future perhaps di di dictate the need for more refined analysis. I think it's quite uncharted waters for all of us and uh, probably need to refine it. Um, yes, practical experience will dictate future. Yes, uh, but unfortunately, if tampering can be avoided and, and, and theft uh, be minimized, um, then surely it can work. Increase awareness of electricity use. Uh, we suggest a portal. Uh, consumers can calculate their use uh, on low types and uh, will promote the awareness. But, uh, Chair, I think we must just, uh, I think we must be realistic. It's going to have challenges, um, especially um, that uh, our main, main as much user friendly as possible. In the absence of smart, smart meters, should benchmark the question. If explained in a transparent fashion, be the only cost effective approach, according to us. Uh, constraints in, in data to NASA. I don't think if there's proper communication via the portal or public media that, uh, that there will be any issues regarding that. Will the energy demand surveys be reasonable so substitute for more, uh, smart meters? Uh, we don't think uh, tend to respond. So more firm options as proposed in, in, in paragraph F above. Um, do you, uh, we believe in a benchmark demand is fair? Yes, consumers will allow will be allowed to object to individual um, uh, on basis apologies. And uh, do we believe separate uh, service tariffs are reasonable? Probably, um, if determined and ring fenced transparently and correctly. Uh, we can't see any justification for uh, 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 IPP levies, uh, um, so yeah, that that will have to be reevaluated for capacity. We fail to see how this will adhere to the principle of cost reflective uh, reflective reflectivity for users of electricity. It should therefore not be paid as a cap uh, capacity or similar charge by everyone. Um, the price reviews, and, and I've referred earlier to it, and we, we suggest annually, it will probably be most practical uh, to, con um, to conduct price reviews. Then uh, on, on the consumer methodology, the consumer methodology I've proposed is still uncharted, uh, as I've mentioned also before, Territory, but seems to be a fair and way of calculation. And I must say, again, uh, I like the approach of, of, of uh, the, the, the duck curve in terms of aligning supply and demand and taking, uh, especially in consideration, the consumer needs. Um, we'll also send um, the correct signals. Uh, most probably it will work correct signals and there will be a built-in evaluate where agriculture will fit in. Um, what other approaches? Uh, um, appropriate tech, uh, technologies may require trial and error options in terms of the proposed system. If sufficient information is provided, it should suffice. Mimic market forces uh, is fair or not. The market forces are probably the only way to reveal true cost and, and competitive returns um, on, on subsidies. Uh, uh, yeah, are still to prevail. Market forces will require to determine the real cost thereof. And then um, what other options should be considered for a rewarding load shift or lower price? Discounts limited may be applied in addition to price limits. Chair, thank you very much. Uh, I think I'm basically in my 20 minutes, so thank you very much again for the opportunity. It's much appreciated. Thank you very much, Mr. Tredom. Actually, you still finished uh, at 18 minutes, so well timed. Thank you for giving us two minutes back. And um, all right, uh, members, you have your pre the presentation before you. Any questions from Mr. Tredom? I know he's posed questions to us. Um, which we, as indicated, won't be able to answer at this platform, but we'll be able to subsequently indicate when we consider the, um, the, 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 the actual methodology, we'll be able to respond to a number of these questions at that stage. But any questions for, of, of clarity for Mr. Stradom? Can I see by show of hands, members? Okay, Mr. Nkise, I was getting a little bit worried. <laughs> Mr. Nkise, any questions for Mr. Stradon? Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Chairperson, and thanks, Mr. Stradon. Uh, just um, uh, one question from my side, because I note that you have um, uh, directly dealt with the questions, and um, 
most of them seem to be in the affirmative. Uh, but I would like to know as to, for example, if you're talking of um, uh, 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 question two in terms of um, the prudency. For example, what, what specific recommendation on how that should be conducted do you, do you uh, put forth? Um, and I think that that also goes to uh, other issues that you have responded to. But just to, to I, and for example, I understand the issue of uh, the timing to say five years from your side, it seems to be too long, but you won't be able to mm. give time until such time that maybe further more details are provided as to what kind of information would be required. We should then be able to to take to talk to the frequency of 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 that um, provision of information. Um, if if I understood you correctly, there, uh, but it's just the, the 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 mechanics of how things are going to be. What what do you, do you suggest things should be done? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mkiza. Madam Masetti. Thank you, Chairperson. And I would like to thank the presenter for the for, for the presentation. And I note the support on a number of um, uh, measures that are contained in the methodology. I just have uh, three questions. One is um, a question that relates to um, the fact that you mentioned that the agricultural the agricultural sector faces an inelastic demand, right? So I would like then to understand perhaps the the proposed measures, whether such measures will have any possible adverse effects uh, in the way that everybody must uh, account for the consumption of electricity. So do you foresee any adverse uh, effects uh, on the agricultural sector as a result of the measures that are proposed uh, in, the, in the consultation paper? I think that the question is very important for us so that we can be in a position to do some, you know, an ex ante impact assessment on what is being proposed before we take a sort of a final decision on the matter. So we would like to hear you particularly if you are facing an inelastic um, uh, demand curve. Um, then the, the, the second question that I would like to test with you is, uh, it relates to the concerns around the timing um, of, uh, of, of this, of this uh, uh, consultation paper, this methodology to migrate to uh, regulation of tariffs. Some state that there's a number of things happening in the industry at this moment in time. Um, there's, there's a revision of the Electricity Regulation Act and also the electricity pricing policy. There's a restructuring. So there's a whole lot of things that are happening. And, and they're asking whether the timing of, um, of a shift from revenue regulation I, I, I do take note that revenue will still be determined uh, in the process of determining the tariff as a core step in that process. I do appreciate that. But that shift of determining the, re the, the, the tariff um, as opposed to looking into the revenue. I'd like to understand what is your view in terms of what the industry requires at this stage? Do you think that this intervention by the regulator um, it is, 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 is perfect timing for the industry, and it is something that the industry should do it right now to um, avoid any further um, um, a detriment to consumers and businesses with the current pricing. I'd like to hear you on that. Um, then the, 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 the other issue that I would like to uh, test with you um, is on the issue of the of the load profile. I do appreciate your earlier comment where you say that you're still uncertain about where the agricultural sector will fall uh, in these load um, uh, uh, categories, customer load categories. However, what I would like to understand is the um, the challenge that has been 
pointed out by stakeholders saying that, um, asking whether um, this kind of categorization is realistic, at least for the regulator, to the extent that there will be data that will be required, enormous data that will be required. But not only that, but the fact that the regulator must also allocate customers accordingly. Will the regulator be in a position to do so? That is what stakeholders are saying. So how do you emphasize this? How do you, how, what is your proposal or advice uh, in the way in which the regulator must execute this task in a seamless manner? What would you say the regulator should look at? Those are the three questions, Chairperson, that I would like to uh, pose. Thank you. Thank you, members. Mr. Stradom, um, for me, just two questions of clarity. I think uh, maybe it's just more clarifying how perhaps we, we may have, we thought we had written the consultation paper. Um, firstly, the first one, again, talks to this load, um, load profiling. That is it perhaps not clear in the consultation paper that what, what, what is indicated is that each consumer would potentially have all four categories. And that is the extent to which that each category, um, to, to, each, to which each stakeholder, would, each consumer group would have those categories. Um, and, and it's the extent to which they use that, that perhaps may then impact their costs. Uh, or their class of electricity. Is, is, is that perhaps not clear in the paper? So um, maybe we can then clarify that later. That is not that what, what it is being intended in the paper is that uh, agriculture only has one type of load profile because it's, uh, yeah. So I guess I'm, I'm just trying to understand perhaps whether that's not clear. Number two, the issue of the IPP levy, again, I'm not sure that that is also, it seems like it's unclear. Maybe you can indicate where, where which part, because uh, again, when you when you write something, you think something is clear that says, um, if you've got merit order dispatch and you've got self-dispatching plants, these two, those two tend to be incongruent. And, and, and therefore you then say, well, these other ones, you've got things that, these costs, sorry, these, these, um, the, 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 the IPPs uh, come, apologies, come with, uh, with PPAs and an obligation to pay uh, in terms of deemed energy, whether it's at night or whatever, as long as I've produced. But now the issue that, that then comes at, how does that relate to, uh, to, to merit order dispatch? They may not necessarily be the cheapest. Now, is it not clear in the paper that kind of description uh, what the, the, the justification of why saying, well, with with the things that if you've got contracted um, take or pay, if you've got take or pay contracts, you need to honor those anyway. So therefore, you, you, you package it so that you, you continue to honor them irrespective of the merit order dispatch. Is that not clear in the paper? So it's just those two issues of clarity for me so that at least when we proceed, we'll understand exactly what your concerns in this particular case were. Thank you. Over to you, Mr. Trelong. As, as we've indicated, you don't have to respond to all of them off the cuff. You can give yourself time and think the answers through and provide them in writing, but you can respond to those that you wish to respond to now. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you, and thank you to the uh, the questions. Uh, it's it's really appreciated, and yeah, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to to think properly uh, uh, to the questions. And and I would really like uh, and prefer to to write uh, the answers in, in writing uh, to you to you com uh, as a committee uh, because of of the importance of the whole issue. And I don't want to uh, yeah um, water it down, but I think um, just to touch on on, on uh, especially the, the 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 low elasticity of the demand, um, uh, that's something that we will have to go and and, and rethink properly um, in terms of the effect, uh, uh, as uh, Ms. Uh, Masetti indicated. Um, the the timing, um, yeah, it's 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 it, uh, it's also it's a difficult uh, question to answer in terms. Uh, uh, of, of the timing and all the, that's taking place at this stage. But I think the importance for us as an agriculture sector, and, and, and I referred to it in my presentation as well, is the, the constant uh, um, sustainable supply of electricity. So if, if um, 
these changes need to be implemented to to uh, address that and assist with uh, addressing it. Then uh, timing is 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 perfect. Um, uh, we shouldn't let uh, any other changes or in the uh, in the acts or whatever influence it, but because we just need that uh, the sustainable um, supply. Um, in terms of the load profile, um, uh, yes, as as you refer to the four, um, and 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 probably their culture might uh, be within all those four. Um, I, I just thought in terms of our seasonality. Um, uh, there are there are certain peaks, and I don't know perhaps whether the thinking of the load profiles will include something like uh, uh, seasonality. And we've been um, having these requests from members a long time ago already. That in, in, in for example in summertime where our peak demand is high, and and in the winter months uh, lower, uh, how can we perhaps do that banking? Or so I'm just. Yeah, we just thought in, it, perhaps uh, one can consider um, a profile uh, more specifically for for agriculture, but that's something that we can just have a discussion on. It's not, um, uh, yeah. I just think to taking taking uh, the seasonality of agriculture in, in consideration might might impact uh, the, the the load profiles. But but you're absolutely right, Chair, that. Um, they definitely there will be a need for all four of the the current uh, suggested uh, um, load profiles. Um, <clears throat> so, Chair, yeah, with your approval, I would really like uh, to 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 comment in writing regarding all the questions. And again, thank you for for the opportunity to to present, and then also thank you for the the questions. Uh, we really appreciate it, and um, and thank you to the committee, and all of the best with the 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 the. the, the the sessions and, and the decision making. I think this is critical for us um, and not uh, for us as a sector, but for us as a country as well in terms of electricity supply. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stradom. And also thank you for, for responding to the call for consumers to please participate. This is not just about the supplies of electricity. It is about an industry. An industry has got two sides to it, buyers and sellers. If you focus on one, the other will fall, you know, either way, you can't focus yes. just on the consumers, you can focus on both. Thank you, Mr. Strano. Thank you. Um, and on behalf of NASA, we would like to thank you for your, for your input and we're looking forward to your further written comments uh, within seven days. Much appreciated. Thank you. Jim. You can now, you can now unshare your presentation. Thank you. Sir. All right. Um, with that first presentation, we now go straight and uh, it was well on time. Uh, very well timed. Thank you, uh, Mr. Stradom, actually, uh, for giving us some time back. Uh, we now move on to the second presentation of the day. Uh, it will be by Ms. Kay Walsh, Nova Economics. Um, if I can see you first, Madam, and so we can swear you in. Uh, Ms. Walsh, can I kindly see? See you. Coming in and coming in. Okay. All right. Thank you. We can see you now. Do you object okay, to taking an do you object to taking an oath or an or an affirmation? No. Okay. In that case, kindly raise your right hand and affirm the following. Do you solemnly declare that the information or the evidence that we are going to give to this panel is the truth and the whole truth as you know it? Yes, I do. For the record, please state your name, the organization you are representing, and your designation therein, please. Uh, my name is Kay Walsh. I'm the managing director of a niche economic consultancy called Nova Economics. Thank you. Um, you can now share your presentation and uh, you have 20 minutes, which will start yes. as soon as you start flighting it. Um, yes. Thank you. So you've got uh, 20 minutes for a presentation now. Uh, and the 20 minutes starts now. Over to you. OK, great. Um, super. OK, so just to introduce myself, um, I'm Kay Walsh. I'm a economist. Um, I've been working in uh, energy and management consulting and in banking for the past 15 years in South Africa. Um, and yeah, the views I'm presenting this morning uh, represent the joint views of myself and my far more distinguished um, associates, Branko Terzik and Ken Costello, 
Branko used to be a commissioner at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission in the United States. And Dr. Ken Costolo as a specialist regulatory economist also in the United States, um, who both of whom have over 30 years of experience. Um, in in re regulation of public and privately owned um, utilities across the world. Um, yeah, so we have been doing some work together. So um, this kind of reflects our joint but um, in views, independent views as economists um, on the proposals that nurses making to change the methodology. Um, so firstly, we just wanted to record that the existing methodology, which includes um, cost-based and some incentive rate making components, is, is uh, one of the most progressive and modern electric utility rate making schemes worldwide. So there's fundamentally nothing wrong um, in the views of my colleagues with the approach that NERSA has currently adopted to determining, well, the framework, should I say, um, to determining ESCOM um, tariffs or the tariffs of other licensees. Um, so what we don't agree with is that it's the it's what required is an overhaul. We don't agree that that's required. Um, we think that all the changes that NERSA wants to implement can be achieved quite easily within the existing framework in terms of making tariffs, you know, unbundling tariffs, making them more cost reflective in, in their design and giving um, consumers more incentive to um, reduce their peak demand. Um, so yeah, another point we wanted to make um, was that it's been the cornerstone, the cost of service approach to utility regulation for over a century internationally and for good reason, because it allows the utility to, um, or the regulator to set the tariff at a level which reflects the utility's long-term costs of providing electricity or water, whatever it might be providing. And it also promotes the efficient use, so not waste of electricity by consumers. And ultimately it should, if correctly implemented, ensure that utilities like ESCOM remain financially sustainable and are able to raise more capital to invest in new capacity. Um, and yeah, and ultimately cost reflectivity, as we've heard from other speakers, is the sort of underlying principle that each consumer must bear the full cost of the service that they receive unless there is a case to subsidize particular consumers, which should be done separately, um, which would be like poor vulnerable households or vulnerable industries. Um, our overarching recommendation, so we didn't respond to the questions, but we've just sort of taken a more 20,000 view, is that the main thing is that NERSA must continue with the application of a cost of service approach to rate making, but must pay um, closer attention to ensure that ESCOM is allowed to recover all its prudently incurred costs. Um, yeah, so that cost reflectivity is, is probably the most important principle. Uh, we understand there's a history in South Africa of underpricing electricity, of not building up capital reserves to co replace capacity. So the reality is, especially given how disgruntled consumers are with load shedding, that it may not be possible to reach this cost reflective tariff within one year or even one multi-year period. But what is important is that NERSA must clearly stipulate what time frame it will enable ESCOM to transition to this cost reflective tariff. And what that implies is it's going to need government support in the interim to, to cover the costs that are not covered by its tariff. Um, and we think that the best way to do this is not to fiddle with the return on assets or some other part of the, the regulatory formula, but to introduce a transparent mechanism in the formula to say, OK, the subsidy to consumers is X billion this year that will be paid effectively by government and that will reduce, say, over a five year period. Um, most of the, the kind of issues that NERSA has raised in its consultation paper can easily, as I mentioned earlier, be addressed through improving the design and structure of ESCOM's wholesale and retail tariffs. And this is already captured in your existing methodology, but not in the revenue requirement 
parts, the first step, but in the cost of supply framework and the, the retail tariff plan. And I'll I'll just I've mapped out the process so that those who are not familiar with it understand where that comes in. Um, it is very important that the tariffs obviously are unbundled vertically. Uh, ESCOM is already I understand in the process of doing that um, because transmission and distribution are likely to remain a natural monopoly while generation will hopefully over the next 10 to 15 years become more competitive. Um, there's also a lot that ESCOM and NERSA can do to improve the, the design of the tariffs to better incentivize customers to reduce their peak demand. Um, and to give ESCOM a, a more realistic opportunity to collect those costs in its bills. And it's absolutely NERSA's role to evaluate proposals that ESCOM puts before it and decide whether the changes are in the public interest. Um, it was concerning to us that, yeah, it was just over the years, the emphasis um, that NERSA has placed on, on keeping tariffs stable. It, it feels to us that the regulator has perhaps misunderstood its role and has believed that it needs to protect the electricity consumer by keeping tariffs stable at all costs. Um, this is not really the fundamental objective of economic regulation. As one of the speakers um, mentioned earlier, the fundamental objective is to achieve the orderly and efficient development and operation of electricity supply, to ensure that the interests and needs of present electricity and consumers are safeguarded and met, and to facilitate adequate investment in the industry. Um, obviously, what NERSA wants to avoid is, is unnecessary fluctuations or sharp increases in prices, and that's perfectly reasonable as a tariff design objective which is why we wouldn't advocate for a one-off adjustment to cost reflective tariffs overnight. Um, but yeah, I mean, as a consumer, I would also like my gas and petrol prices to remain flat or unchanged or increase in line with CPI. But realistically, that would mean that, you know, the oil and gas businesses would either go bankrupt or the state would have to foot the bill. And that's obviously not a tenable situation. Um, yeah, I think um, just to re-emphasize that cost reflectivity is the most fundamental principle, one standard of reasonable rates that can fairly be said to outrank all others um, is the standard of cost of service qualified by the stipulation that the cost must be necessary, true and reasonably incurred. So obviously we are not advocating that consumers have to pay for cost overruns that were due to mismanagement or to corruption, um, but we are advocating that all reasonably incurred costs must, the regulator must allow um, licensees to recover. Um, I'm not gonna go through the objectives, that was just to say that keeping prices flat or stable or in line with CPI doesn't appear anywhere in the objectives of our act or pricing policy, they are being revised, but these objectives won't fundamentally change, um, as I understand. And I will, yeah, I mean, that just carries on from the point I've been trying to make. Um, we've estimated that the revenue ESCOM generated in FY 2020 was probably between 25% and 35% lower than the costs it incurred, and that's highly problematic because it has led to sharp deterioration in, in ESCOM's financial position. I'm not saying the low tariff is the only problem at ESCOM. We all know there have been other problems at ESCOM over the past five years. Um, but I think, yeah, management is in a much better position now than it was. And hopefully some of the monies lost due to mismanagement and corruption can be recovered by the utility. Um, yeah, just generally, there's no there's no valid reason to keep tariffs below the cost of providing electricity. Um, and international experience suggests that when this happens, it's usually in response to political pressure or the objection of consumers who are always going to object to higher tariffs. Um, but the irony is that holding tariffs below costs is very socially damaging, um, and it's far more detrimental to the economy and utilities in the long run as it you know, results in either 10 hours of load shedding a day or 
um, a bankrupt state, a government that has to bail out the utility. Um, and it just makes it harder, as, as, as has been demonstrated in our case, for ESCOM to then raise the capital it needs to meet future demand if, it, if its tariffs don't cover its costs. Um, absolutely do not contest that um, NERSA has the right and obligation to ESCOM's customers to exclude any costs that are not, that are truly imprudent. But, you know, there is a clear process internationally that is followed uh, to determine what to dispute uh, costs that NERSA or a regulator believes are imprudent. Um, the onus is unfortunately on the staff of the regulator or the interveners they've appointed to provide evidence that the costs were a result of imprudent action. They have to allow the utility to recover costs that are due variations that are out of its control, like a change in international diesel prices or coal prices or uh, unfortunate weather events, etc. There is actually, my colleagues have given me some help in this regard, but there is actually a very clear process NERSA can follow to detect imprudent costs. Um, and I'm sure they'd be happy to, to present to you on that if you, um, if you wish. Um, I think we're running out of, of time, or maybe I've got a few more minutes. <laughs> um, yeah, so we were just concerned that some of the criticisms you have of your existing methodology, which we note is actually capable of um, making many of the changes that you would like to see, are not, you know, there's not much merit to them from an economic um, perspective. Um, you, you've argued, for example, that the methodology guarantees ESCOM's revenues and provides little incentive for them to reduce their costs. But it's very obvious to all of us that it hasn't guaranteed ESCOM's revenues. Um, their financial positions deteriorated significantly in the last five years, while tariff increases have been quite low. And um, it's it's actually not able to service its debt and um, capital investment requirements. Um, there is also yeah the, also the argument that ESCOM's revenue um, is guaranteed. Um, it's not yeah it's definitely not guaranteed um, and. Um, we don't agree with the statement that the goal of introducing regulation. Um, sorry, is is. I mean, sorry that the MYB, MYPDM in its current format doesn't enable competition and promotes monopoly. Um, we we really don't agree with that. The whole objective of of regulation is to try and simulate the conditions of a competitive market. Um, we also understand that there are power market reforms that are happening in parallel, which will over time allow greater competition in the industry. Um, but from uh, my colleagues' experience in the US, it's it's a gradual process and it will take a few decades before we have a truly competitive wholesale electricity generation market. Um, so there's going to be a need for NERSA to play a role in parallel to developing the, the competitive market at least for the next decade or two. Um, and yeah, and transmission and, and distribution are going to remain natural monopolies and you'll need to regulate them using the cost of service approach. Um, just wanted to move to the, the process. Um, yeah, there was an argument presented that the existing MYP4 methodology doesn't allow for the unbundling adequate unbundling of um, the tariff. Um, we don't agree with that. Um, so we note that the process is actually a three-step process. At the beginning of each multi-year rate period, the determination of the revenue requirement is only the first step. And then it's during the allocated cost of service study and the preparation of the retail tariff plan that there's an opportunity for NERSA to comment on whether it's happy with the way that ESCOM has allocated costs to users at a very disaggregated level. Um, they, there's a cost of supply framework um, that NERSA has approved that, that outlines how they break down the costs by, by service, by um, main function, 
by cost category and then try and allocate these to consumers. And then they use the unbundled costs to, and the, in, in the case where they have data on, on load profiles per customers, they can also unbundle it for time of use. And then they can use those to um, prepare tariffs. So we think there's an opportunity there for NERSA to, to make the changes at once um, in, in step two and three of the existing um, tariff process. And then I think I'll just probably end with um, the RCA debate um, because I think I'm I'm out of time. Um, but yeah, NERSA has maintained, or maybe not NERSA so much. Well, NERSA did maintain that the RCA mechanism ruins its efforts to provide um, price stability, but there have also been complaints from various um, customer groups in the past. Um, and we just wanted to note that it's um, you have to, as a regulator, grant ESCOM retrospective adjustment and tariffs for variance between their forecast and actual cost. So at the beginning of the, the multi-year rate period, they forecast what their costs are going to be over three years. And even the best forecaster is not going to be able to perfectly predict the future. So there will always be some variance. I mean, it might be, as I say, due to a variance in international oil or coal prices. It may be to a variance in employee costs. It may be due to um, unexpected breakdown of plant and equipment. Um, so there's always needs to be some mechanism where the, where the utility can recover variances in costs between forecast and actual. Um, and even and alternative forms of regulation like the price cap system, um, which is used in, in the UK, um, at the beginning of the multi-year period, the tariffs are determined based on cost of service. And then while they're adjusted in the, in, in the interim years using inflation, there's still an adjustment factor, a Y factor, which allows for the regulator to approve the pass through, through of costs that were due to um, you know, it, external factors that varied, um, maybe lower than expected sales or um, higher than expected primary energy costs, etc. Um, basically, our recommendations on the RCA mechanism is that um, you retain it because there is inevitably a variance between forecast and actual due to some external factors and due to the fact that no one has perfect foresight. But the things that you can do as the regulator to make sure the variances aren't as wild as they have been in the past. Um, the one thing you can do is to encourage ESCOM to restructure its tariff design in that cost of supply and tariff design steps so that they shift more of their costs from volumetric component to the fixed component. 70% of ESCOM's costs are fixed, but they only have a 10% fixed charge. And that means that their revenue won't fluctuate so much when sales deviate um, because they will cover a high, higher portion through a fixed charge. Um, and then I think you also as a regulator need to spend more time to evaluate whether ESCOM's demand forecasts are reasonable, um, you know, when they present them to you. Um, have they followed an economically sound methodology? Um, or have they based their forecasts on aspirational economic growth of three to five percent rather than the present reality? Um, so I think obviously there is a role for NERSA to play there to ensure that the variances are not as great when it allows for annual adjustments. And I think, yeah, I'm going to end there, Chair. Um, I've used my 20 minutes, I do believe. Thank you, Ms. Walsh. Actually, you are left with 18 seconds, but, uh, oh. yeah, but that's fine. No, thank you. Um, thank you for giving us 18 seconds back. Thank you for your presentation. Maybe you could leave the presentation on the screen, because I would assume that the members, when they ask questions, they may want to refer to a slide or so. Um, so perhaps just uh, if, if we can keep it on the screen, we'd really appreciate that. Members, uh, you've got a presentation from Nova Economics. Um, if you could then pose your questions to uh, Ms. Walsh.
Um, they're starting with, uh, oh, we had lost. Um, so let's kindly wait for her to join again. Oh, geez, uh, I meant to exit the presentation and I, I exited the call. I see. Okay, no, I noticed. Uh, thank you. You can keep the presentation on the screen, I think, okay. so that uh, members may want to refer to a particular slide um, okay. of the presentation. Okay. All right. Um, the first question, let's go to Madam Asseti. Madam Asseti, you can go ahead, ma'am. Thank you, Chair Peston. Um, I would like to also thank um, uh, Kay for the uh, presentation. Um, I would like to start off with uh, the uh, the approach that you've taken, which says that uh, perhaps NERSA should not um, um, uh, overhaul the existing uh, methodology, but rather perhaps um, look at you know, maybe refining certain aspects of the methodology. I'd like to understand from your perspective, what are the specific aspects of the methodology that you believe are probably not working well and should be the ones that NERSA um, uh, needs to focus, uh, to focus on? If you can assist us with that. Um, but the, the second question though is, um, how should NERSA ensure that consumers do not pay for electricity volumes that were not produced and they were not sold? Is that fair? And um, when the price keeps keep, keep going up um, because consumers must um, actually pay for the shortfall in sales, when the demand is constant, and the prices are going up. Is that is that is that the you know it doesn't really reflect the principle of economics, the inverse relationship that you would expect as an economist, that you would expect from the demand perspective and the price perspective, when there are very clear price elasticities uh, in, in 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 the consumption of electricity. Do you think that is that principle is violated? if the regulator continues to ask consumers to pay more for sales that are not achieved, the capex keep going up, the, 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 the production is, 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 is reduced, the, sale, the, 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 the volumes are also reduced. What do you say about that? And also about the own price elasticity of demand, apart from the cross price elasticity of demand, but the own price elasticity of demand. Can you please comment on that, given your, um, your, 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 your views that you've stated earlier regarding the current methodology? The other point that I would uh, request you to touch on is um, uh, the supply side constraints that uh, perhaps you did not touch on um, and the extent to which consumers must come in and 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 pay for supply side constraints that are that are within um, the licenses control. And for uh, well, by this I mean that any regulator around the world, you want to compensate excellent service. The asset must perform. If the asset fails to perform, and 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 they, and, and what is it that you must compensate for? Even on the fixed, fixed recovery argument, fixed cost recovery argument for the asset that is used and usable, does it mean that if the asset has not been utilized or even when it comes back on service, it will operate, say, for a month or so, you know, again, is susceptible to breakdowns. And, and, and therefore, that asset, nevertheless, the regulator must compensate for it. Is that something that, in your experience in the US, is that what is, um, what is compensated? Is it the way that it should work? That you compensate, not for excellent service, but you must compensate, nevertheless, because you've got fixed costs that you must recover. Is that what you are saying NERSA should do here? I just want to understand that. Um, 
sorry if you can take that question down um and, and, and what are the what are the costs because you you made a point here about uh almost insinuating that and that's a pro probably um, is not compensating ESCOM sufficiently. And um, unfortunately, this is not necessarily about ESCOM, but I'm using it because you mentioned it, because the methodology is not for, for, is not intended to be applicable to ESCOM alone, but other uh, distributors who are licensees of NETSA. But on this point about pricing below cost, I think we all know, and economics will tell you, that this is not desirable. And it may be used under certain circumstances when you're trying to uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, providing a service for network connection and you're trying to incentivize and bring in a lot of people at the beginning. But it's not something that you can um, and continue um, using anyway. Um, so, so I would like to understand what are these costs that you believe um, were not recognized or are not recognized by NERSA? And the, or there is a risk of excluding such cost, such that um, the the tariff that NERSA will determine at the end of the day will be below cost. I'm trying to understand that point that you made around pricing below cost. What does that mean really in our case? And if you look into what has been happening, there is also a lot of emphasis from your side uh, regarding prudency and not so much of efficiency. And, uh, and I thought those are two different tests and standards that NERSA must take into consideration. The prudency test, very different from efficiency. And even when you look at efficiency uh, from a viewpoint of the performance of the asset. So, are you saying that we must give more weight on costs that were completely, you know, uh, out of ESCOM's control, say where that, as you mentioned, um, and, 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 and therefore, you know, ignore or disregard an efficiency test, but not on the efficiency test here. Once you look at those two, there is still public interest grounds that in our context, we need to take into consideration. Uh, I would like to sort of hear you, how should NASA balance those three? Once the technical assessment has been done, when you have a prudency test, you need to also apply efficiency test and out again, look into public interest considerations once you have come up with your outcome on those two. I would like to understand how should we better um, and, uh, you know, maintain a balance so that at the end of the day, we are able to, um, uh, you know, strike that balance uh, in terms of the economic interest of suppliers as well as the consumers on the other hand. And, and, um, uh, those are my uh, questions at this point in time. The last one that I would like her to touch on really is on the issue of um, the time of use tariff design uh, in relation to uncertainty in price elasticities, elasticities of electricity demand. Can you comment on that? So that we can make sure that in the way that even when we include time of use uh, tariffs in the, in, in the proposed methodology, at least to make sure that we deal effectively with the uncertainties associated with the price elasticity of demand. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Asseti. Mr. Mkiza? Thanks, Jefferson, and thanks to Madam Walsh for the presentation. Um, I'll try not to delve into what has already been uh, asked, but um, that's about four questions from my side. One is when it comes to the uh, your slide four, you you, you talk of um, uh, NERSA uh, trying to stabilize prices um, at all costs, so to say, in, in that slide. 
Uh, if, if you look at oh, I mean the, the 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 object of the act, the, the the objects of the of the act, you look at at B, uh, and then um, how in your in your in your understanding should NERSA then uh, um, uh, implement or or, or, or or strive towards the attainment of that object, uh, which deals with the with ensuring the interests and needs of present and future electricity customers and end users uh, being safeguarded and met. Uh, if if there's something that is ultra virus, ultra virus in terms of, of what uh, NERSA six is doing, even six to two in terms of this particular uh, uh, um, methodology, I mean, the, 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 the approach that is being taken now. And then two, you, 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 you spoke on, I think it was like two, you spoke of, of um, uh, NERSA not having allowed ESCOM full recovery of print in cost, in cat cost. So, so what exactly have you identified as a miss in allowing ESCOM full recovery of twenty in, in CAD cost. That that you need to, to then respond to it in terms of the currently moving to what to into the future. Because yes, we're dealing with the, the, the future, but we must try to optimize and do better than currently. So so it's from that point of view. Okay. And then on your on your slide five, um you you seem so sorry on slide four maybe to, to also say you, you you speak of specific requirement for a well structured tariff so so if if you can just uh, help in terms of the the if, if you've got any specific requirement for 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 a, a good or efficient uh, tariff structure that that you or even if you can allude to principles I know that you may not be there yet in particular but I think it 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 will it will also assist. As, as the, 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 the consultation paper deals more with principles and need to delve more into the, the meat of what we are, what we are trying to develop. So if you can just talk to that. And then the, the fourth question is on a slide five, but with you, your argument on slide five seems to suggest that uh, ESCOM's uh, tariffs should have been 25% to 30% more than what they are now. And, 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 um, um, that uh, brings a lot of 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 uh, uh, questions in terms of um, where specifically do you think that uh, uh, they have not been catered for? Particularly when 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 you you saying that the the, the proposal is going to uh, uh, hold tariffs below the cost of providing electricity, because the exercises that we have been having all along have been more on 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 uh, ensuring that uh, uh, they they get fair uh, 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 compensation for for the for, for the cost that they have prudently prudently incurred. I think the issue of prudently has already been said by my colleague being prudent and and efficient. So 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 in, uh, also when when saying that in this particular proposal, where are you uh, drawing a conclusion? That the tariffs are going to be below the cost of providing electricity, which any economist is really worth uh, his salt would uh, know that if you're running be below that, you're actually killing that that entity, and and no one wants a situation where the the utility is being killed. Uh, so I, I just did not get that at all. Okay. Maybe okay. and then and then the the last one from my side is. May, may, may you please provide insights as to why you 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 you, you envisage the transition should take decades instead of years, particularly knowing uh, the, the 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 space that we are in currently with the electricity and also just the energy space being uh, 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 very tumultuous, if I can use the term, and therefore requiring that we take a uh, drastic quick uh, actions and not really, uh, I mean, uh, wait for, for decades 
we, we, with, with all the challenges, including climate change, including water, food, and security, and all of those things, uh, having a relationship with energy. And then you so talking at, uh, uh, and saying that we need decades. One <laughs> listening to that really gets powerful. If you can just assist in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Okay, I, I am worried. What, what, what I don't think you were, you, were, you were taking notes. And I, uh, I thought I, you have participated in this process before. I maybe I should have reminded you. No, no, yes. I am I am taking notes on my screen. <laughs> oh, all right. Okay. No, that's fine. Yeah, all right. yeah. All right. Um, so, uh, maybe before, chair, no, uh, we, no, we don't have much time now. So maybe I can just answer one or two and the rest no, I will draft no, a response. No, 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 no. Okay. Um I, I've got questions for you too. Oh, so you need to okay. take my questions. <laughs> okay. So please hold, please hold, please hold. Okay. All right. The, the 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 first one, the first question I have for you, Ms. Walsh. Yeah. It starts from your understanding. In your slide eight. I I actually pre-framed your questions before we met, but anyway, I, I want to start with slide eight. Okay. What is your understanding of the MYPD process? You seem to say it comprises of three steps. Mm. Is that your understanding? that MYPD is about three steps, that MYPD, what NASA sets and what NASA approves, both in terms of retail tariffs that are charged by ESCOM or retail tariffs that are charged by, by, by municipalities. Are you saying in your understanding, MYPD is that one big block? Your understanding of the MYPD document, if you can just clarify that, because I would have thought that, by the way, please take notes because it's, it's about four, I've got about four questions myself. Okay. So, because I would have thought that MYPD, as, as actually documented as an MYPD document, which is what is being proposed to be changed, is only about one thing and one thing only, how we determine ESCOM revenues. That's it. It's got nothing to do with then once they have the revenues, how they then they translate and bring that back to NASA for approval, both the retail structure as well as the retail tariffs that they propose coming out of that. So if we can clarify that, because I think if we don't clarify yeah, chair, that, we could chair, miss the if chat. I, if I can no. just comment on that one quickly, because mm. it's easy for me to respond. Mm, no, no, okay. Because no, the questions no. are actually related, please. Okay, if you can just, okay. uh, allow me, just take the notes and then you can okay. relate, you can respond to okay. all of the questions in a in, in, in one. So I, 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 I guess for me, I, I would need us to have a, and, that, and that's an important when we communicate to stakeholders out there, what is it that we are, we are talking about? Because the mm. MYPD document is very specific how we set ESCOM revenues. Mm. That's it. From where I'm saying, unless I've got it wrong, and maybe correct me, because we've got three steps there. Right, that, that's, that's the first question. The second question for me, it relates to, um, uh, to, to your slide three which Mr. Nkiza has asked this, but I mean, I want to ask it differently. So your understanding of the law, is that this law, and maybe it talks to why do we regulate? Maybe the question is, is your understanding of regulation that NASA regulates or any energy regulator or any regulator for that matter, we've got the department uh, regulating petrol prices, you, could, you know, that the regulator's primary concern is about the supply side, that it regulates to ensure sustainability of the supply. Is that your understanding? Is that, is that, is, so, 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 and especially in a, mono, in a monopolistic environment, why would, why would, why would you want to, um, what's the possibility of, um, of, of a monopoly not just getting, setting its prices maybe as high as it wants anyway, so why would the regulator be concerned about just ensuring that the supplier is actually um, uh, uh, the, 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 the supply side is sustainable? If that was the case, why not regulate all sectors then and give them a price or no, no, approve them a revenue uh, for each of the sectors in the country such that all of the suppliers are actually sustainable? Is that the reason for regulation? So that, that's my, my primary question because I'm I, I, and is that what you understand as the objects of the Electricity Regulation Act? It is about ensuring supply stability. That's the first question. 
or is it about both supply as well as demand? Maybe focus more on demand, if that's your view. Some people may actually hold that, that view. Number two, on slide six, again, this is a question of asked by Mr. Nkise. Tariff increases have been low. I'm not sure, I mean, I, are you saying, and, and even go that maybe 20, 25% lower than they should. But I mean, the question that I ask is that, okay, firstly, if you answered your question, the first question I asked, whether we regulate revenue or regulate tariffs, perhaps you should be able to then um, answer this, this, slide, this, this question maybe slightly differently as well. But it then says, when you say tariff increases have been low, I mean, my calculations or the calculations that are out there is that between 20, 2008 and 2019, the revenue increased 320%, and the associated tariff increased 340%. That's public numbers. That's low by your, by your, by your view. So are you, are you saying that tariff increases in that period should actually have been, we should have doubled the price but well, increase 500 percent, not double. So increase 500 percent, fivefold. Is that your your assertion? Um, I have a a more fundamental question to you. I actually have two. You, you know, they, they, there's always this mention that you know whatever NASA is proposing is not done anywhere. But the question that I want to ask is that when a benchmark. Because benchmark is important, that like we are saying, well, if you're doing it this way, where else in the world is being done? In the particular place, this is not done. So the question I would ask is that, and if we were to actually just, if from your point of view, if you could maybe just assist us with examples, when we're looking to, to effect a change, yes, you perhaps say there's no need for a change, but if we're saying we're wanting to make changes, but you're wanting to then benchmark, can we maybe just start and say, when we make reference to this is globally accepted approach that, that, that in terms of how we, we actually um, um, regulate ESCOM, if you can just point out, I, 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 I would say maybe outside of Africa, somebody did say that uh, we can't compare ourselves with, uh, with, uh, with, with the Uganda. I guess we are much better than, than Uganda as, as a country. So we must compare ourselves with our peers. So we shouldn't compare ourselves perhaps with anybody in Africa because we're much bigger than all of them, uh, maybe except Egypt. But the point is, if we were to compare ourselves, who would we compare with? And we say, in respect of how, we, how we're how currently regulating, if you, come, if you look at North, South America, Europe, Australasia, which of the countries regulate the electricity industry Again, in respect of setting, determining um, a utility revenue like we do in the country. Just maybe you can point us to just one example globally. Um, so that when we say this is what is done, at least we can go and verify and check those countries. Which country in the world? Other than, of course, let's take ourselves out of Africa. We are bigger than, we're better than Africa as stated by some people, which other country does what we do? Maybe two, to be nice if we pick up one from Australia, one from Australasia, one from North America, and perhaps South America. Just point us in that direction. I have, however, just one last question for you, which is a more <laughs> fundamental question for you that I wanted to ask. And I'll ask it like this. And maybe just I'll ask you this and say, tell me what's wrong with this logic. I'm going to give you a logic. Tell me what's wrong with it. That in anything that we do, if we provide a goods or provide a service or whatever that might be going to be provided, that how you go about pricing it is that you price your capacity. Say, I've got this capacity, I price my capacity. Taking into account that if I overprice it, I might not sell anything. If I underprice it, I might leave money on the table. That in pricing anything, that you price your capacity. That's the first point of call. Number two, although I would say step two for me, 
should always be step one. But anyway, step two, you then say, okay, let me understand what my, cons my consumers are willing or capable of paying. That's step two, that you've now plussed your capacity. You've decided this is what I'm going to say this I'm provide or the, the good I'm going to provide. And you've decided on the capacity. Now you, you basically then say, okay, the thing that I'm going to produce, gadgets or service, this is the price. But you then go to the market and say, okay, what are the, what are the consumers willing to buy, uh, to pay for the service or capable of buying or paying for the service? That's step number two. And then thirdly, then saying, well, I know what my targeted price is. I understand what, uh, this, um, what the consumers are willing to pay or capable of paying. And then you say, I want to sell this capacity. And that I then realize the revenue through the sale of the capacity rather than me setting the price upfront um, to give me a particular revenue. Maybe let, let me just repeat the last step. What I'm simply saying is that, so in this logic, where you've priced your capacity, you've understood your, your customer, but thirdly, then you then said, I'm selling uh, the, the capacity and I'll realize the revenue from the amount of, sub, of, of capacity that I will actually sell. And if I sell less than what I, I, I thought I would sell, I'll realize less revenue. If I sell more, brilliant for me. What's wrong with that, with that logic? As it applies to everything else that happens in the world. And why would that logic, if that logic holds, why would it not hold in the electricity sector? Those are my questions. Over to you then. You can, you, you, you can decide which questions you're going to reply to online uh, for now, and then you can then decide which ones you, you want to respond to in writing. Over to you, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Um, I think, Chair, thank you for everyone for all the questions. Um, yeah, I will definitely try my best to respond to them more comprehensively in writing, or perhaps we need a session <laughs> um, where we can discuss some of these matters. I'm also happy to do that if you like. Um, but yeah, basically, um, the tariff design process that I was referring to or what they refer to in the US as the rate making process under the cost of service approach um, is always three steps, no matter where it's applied in the world. So um, in the US, it's, uh, this is the main approach used to regulate public and private utilities um, and has been since, you know, the 1930s. Um, and it's also widely used in Europe and Australia, et cetera. So on your point of where they're benchmarks, I can give you several. Um, but basically, it's a three-step process. So the first step is quite a scientific thing. There's not much tariff principles coming into it. And that is your MYPD methodology. That's what your MYPD methodology covers primarily. And that's just to determine what revenue does ESCOM need to cover its costs. And um, that includes the cost of capital. So utilities, it's a capital intensive business. By far the biggest portion of the cost is actually paying the finance on the debt you incurred to build the plants um, and the transmission networks, et cetera. The second step, um, which, and this doesn't happen every time there's a multi-year period, but it should happen every time you think there's been major changes in the structure of the electricity market is ESCOM or your other licensees, whoever they might be in future, will go away and determine, as I said, a very detailed study. And NERSA also provides um, guidelines, which they approved in 2015, on how to unbundle the cost. So they're not going to give all consumers one tariff. They actually do a very detailed exercise to allocate the costs to the different categories, functions and customers. Um, and at the end of the day, they get, OK, we think this is the cost, uh, generation, transmission, distribution to serve this agricultural customer in Limpopo um, or this industrial customer in KwaZulu-Natal, these categories that obviously don't do each individual one. And then they use, that's how you then have an opportunity as a regulator to work with the licensee 
to then bring in tariff principles to say, how are you going to collect these costs in a fair way um, from these customers? How are you going to design your tariffs so that you accurately correct the right costs from the customers who are causing the costs? Um, so yeah, like I say, I'm aware that this doesn't happen. These three steps don't happen every time you have a um, a new NYPD period, but they are three steps that have to happen in order to get to ESCOM schedule of tariffs. And I'm puzzled as to why your consultation paper focused so much on the revenue requirement part when actually most of the issues you want to address relate to how they allocate their costs to different customers and functions and then subsequently to how they design the tariffs. So revenue requirements has nothing to do with time of use, load profiles, all of those issues are addressed in steps two and three and every single regulator that applies the cost of service methodology internationally has those three steps. Um, and then on the my second slide, which I never got to, is the process you're currently following in the second and third years of a multi-year rate period, which as we say, we've established the revenue for three years. Now each year we just see, is it what we expected? Was there variance? Do we need to make an annual adjustment? And if everything is done well, these shouldn't be massive adjustments. Um, this is just purely to allow ESCOM the opportunity to recover costs it didn't anticipate or yeah it had incorrect forecasts everyone's going to have an incorrect forecast ask the imf or treasury no one no one has perfect foresight um but yeah so that's a shorter process so yes i think uh, there's nothing wrong with your process to determine the revenue requirement there's nothing wrong with your mypd methodology in fact there's nothing wrong with your whole process it's just that you need to pay more attention um to ESCOM's cost to serve study and its retail tariff plan and how these costs are allocated. Um, sorry, I'll go back Chair, to some of the other questions you had um, and your previous speakers. Um, yeah, I have emphasized throughout the presentation that pricing below cost is desirable and people are saying, well, how come with all these price increases we had five years ago. I'll note that since about um, 2017, tariffs, nurses kept tariffs pretty much in line with CPI, but prior to that, it allowed big increases. Um, and that's, yeah, that's a complicated history, Chair. Um, right back in the bad old days in the 80s, um, the then government had a policy of subsidizing electricity and we're selling it well below the cost of producing power to try and attract um, industry. And so by the time we got to the 2000s, we had very cheap electricity in South Africa, way below the normal international norm. So there was an adjustment that had to happen. And it's unfortunate that it had to happen over such a short period. And at the moment, then the reason why ESCOM needs um, higher tariffs is to to replace its aging coal fleet. So you'll know that its 40 year old plants are falling over and um, it now needs to raise capital to, to now um, replace that capacity, not just it, but IPPs as well. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, as you incur debt to build new plants, you're going to have to service the cost of that debt. And that's what drives predominantly the tariff up. It's very little is from employee costs or from primary energy costs. It's actually mostly to do with um, trying to recover the cost of investing in new new capacity in any utility globally. Um, in terms of the question of, um, yeah, and, and there are things that you can do um, and that you must do as the regulator to make sure we don't get price shocks of 25 to 30% per year. Um, and there's a lot of work that can be done around looking at the, the length of period you depreciate these assets over, et cetera, et cetera, to try and smooth the burden between current and future um, consumers. Because it's not just the current consumers that will benefit from the new plant, but also those in 20 years' time. Um, there, I absolutely don't um, advocate that um, the regulator should only be concerned with um, ESCOM's needs or the supplier's needs. 
Um, but you heard from our previous speaker that the only thing agricultural consumers really want now is a sustainable electricity supply at a reasonable cost. What they absolutely don't need is interrupted power um, at a cheap price. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just about balancing um, the, the needs of consumers to receive stable supply and trying to ensure that ESCOM operations are reasonably efficient. Any profit ESCOM makes goes to the government. So it's it's not a profit maximizing um, utility. Um, it's not a private utility, it's public. So any profit ESCOM made, which it hadn't made um, in a long time, um, would go to South African citizens effectively. Um, but there is an issue with ESCOM that it may not be as efficient um, as you would like, and as a state-owned entity vulnerable to corruption and, and those kind of issues. So, um, yeah, I think as a regulator, your job is to make sure that there's, when there are cost overruns, on particularly on capital projects, that they are justified. When Madupi and Casida were being built, for example, if there was, if costs were suddenly doubling, is it for good reason or is it because, you know, there's evidence of mismanagement or corruption? And that's the point where you as a regulator have the biggest um, opportunity to influence the tariff. Um, um, hey, sorry to disturb you. Yeah. Um, no. We, yeah, um, um, can, I, can I request that, um, so to allow you to formulate your responses in a succinct and also provide like for instance, when we ask for for, for specificity for specificities, you actually then indicate which country in particular. For instance, when you make to the US, when you make comments about the US, uh, which state in the US, because the first I understand in the US prices are not set, the prices are set by the market, right? So, mm. but if you make reference to that, point us to the state in the US. That are, so, I'm, can I can I ask you that you provide the answers to us in writing? And then yes. you can actually be very specific in terms of 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 your responses to the questions that we may have posed. Is that fair? Yes, I think that's fair. Yeah, there were a lot of questions here, so I'm going to struggle, and they're quite complex issues. I'm going to struggle yes. to give give responses now. Yes. Um, you've, but you've yeah. got seven days. You've got seven days. Um, so we will then officially close um, um, the input, the public input, in seven days uh, after today. So you've got seven okay. days to prepare your, your extra responses. If, if if you can send this to us, please, we really appreciate okay. it. We'd like to thank All you right. for your for your input. Um, yeah, thank you. And that, it was a and robust that, and that discussion, your... and uh, look forward to you <laughs> providing yes, you, further comment. Correct. You can share your presentation in the mint in the meantime. So at least we can then okay. have that on record. Uh, but you know, on behalf of NASA, I'd like to thank you for your for your for your for your participation. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank, thank you, Chair. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will now move to the third presenter, Mr. Frank Hinder, but can I maybe just give members uh, a uh, even a, a five minute comfort break? So we start again at um, at 10.47, if you might, maybe let's just make it 10.50. Um, just a five minute comfort break. And uh, Mr. Hinder, if you can then in the meantime, prepare yourself, uh, make sure that uh, you can share the presentation and uh, you don't need the full screen for to, to be sworn in. So even if you just share the presentation, as long as we can see you when when you're being sworn in, um, and I do know you understand this process very well. So yes, members, five minutes, and then we'll be back at ten fifty uh, for Mr. Hinda's presentation. Thank you.
The front hinder. We can see you. And it is 10.50. We are right on time. Um, I hope you can hear me. Good morning, sir. Yes, I can hear you. All right. No, thank you. Um, so, as you know, in terms of routine, we start by the swearing in to ensure that uh, the evidence you give is the truth and the whole truth as you know it. So, I'll ask the question again. Do you object to taking an oath for an affirmation? I don't, sir. Uh, in that case, kindly of raise your right hand and affirm the following. Do you solemnly declare that the evidence or the information that you are going to give to this panel is the truth and the whole truth as you know it? I do. For the record, kindly of state your name, uh, the entity you are representing, and your designation in it, please. I'm Frank Hinder from C representing City Power. I'm the manager of tariffs at City Power. Thank you, Mr. Hinda. As you, you know the drill, um, you've got 20 minutes for your presentation and, um, and your 20 minutes will start now. Please proceed, sir. Um, thank you, Chairperson, and good morning to the panel and to the colleagues. Um, my presentation will take up, um, as a utility, will take a practical perspective of how um, this is going to affect us and and um, in terms of that we will look at a uh, few of the uh, proposed items in the methodology meaning the basic rules the key elements elements of the methodology and uh, the critical the free critical principles and then we will then propose a way what we uh, way forward in terms of what we think we best should do with this now Obviously, we are a utility and we are regulated by NERSA. So um, should this methodology be adopted, um, um, we are obliged to, to comply. So therefore, we would want to, when we then looked at this um, to understand how it would then impact us. Practically, what does it mean practically for us? And in so doing, our assessment is that the comments that, that we made in previous rounds um, uh, on the framework now referred to as methodology did did not go unnoticed and were considered even if it's not all of it so we are making um, uh, we we have seen the change compared to the previous um, version of of the framework or methodology however our practical consideration of the proposed methodology it is that it may be suggesting that it's still work in progress but it may require further enhancement. It talks about data collection. Would it be required to be tested? We should be sample implemented before we go on a full scale rollout um, of it. But um, yes. And, and lastly, the methodology seems to suggest to transform nurses' role from that of being a referee to a player. In other words, the impression that we are getting is that the um, Utilities will in future be requested to present their budgets and revenue requirements to the regulator, for the regulator to set the tariffs themselves and not just approve as it currently, consider and approve as it currently the case. It that, for example, means that ESCOM um, schedule of tariffs in future will have to be developed by NERSA. In each case, NERSA will require increase in its resource and institutional capacity multiple times. And the role of the utilities will have to change accordingly. Now, if that's what is envisaged, then um, it should come out more clearer because it is a significant change from what we are doing right now. Now, in terms of the three basic rules and why we think that it appears to be work in progress, for example, it, it says the three basic rules for tariff setting. Um, first, it says it's underpinned by revenue requirement, and which we agree agree with. And then it says, it talks about permissible revenue. And when it says to be carried out whenever required by licensee or regulator or set time schedule. Again, it's not clear to us what that means. Um, 
does it mean that every morning I can stand up and ask the regulator to review? Or, or are we moving away from annual tariff setting? It is not clear as it is right now, Chairperson. The basis of calculation of, of permissible revenue must be clearly communicated. That's what the regulation says, or the methodology says, it, and it must be clearly communicated, but I'm not sure whether it goes sufficiently or covers any ground in terms of how the uh, permissible revenue uh, should be calculated. It talks about the rule setting and rates and, and tariffs. All it says is it involves models that incorporate various fits. It's not clearly stated what these things are. However, it suggests to, to, that it's a departure from sales or projection in translation of permissible revenue. But on the other hand, um, if revenue requirement underpins this, then uh, revenue realization is a factor of two things only, price and volume. So I don't know how we can move away from projections um, while the methodology is underpinned by revenue requirement. And when it talks about the rules of alternating, alternating tariffs between the regul regulatory review, the rules used to specify the method used to change the tariffs on a set schedule. Um, again, that's what it says, but it doesn't really go into the rules for what they are. It then talks about fuel-based generating plants will be allowed to further monthly or quarterly make adjustments. What's the implication of that as a utility um, that is buying from ESCOM that anyway it generates from electricity from whatever fuel it, it uses? Some of the key elements that we refer to is the methodology clearly states that if ESCOM generating plant that is um, the methodology should clearly state that if ESCOM, for example, if um, generating plant constantly unavailable of uh, 115,000 to 18,000 megawatt is unavailable constantly, but in the meantime, it is included in the regulatory asset base, earning returns while it's not uh, usable. Those things need to be clarified um, in the methodology. The methodology talks about the historic cost basis being the preferred way of valuing the asset. But in the same time, it says depreciation will be based on um, 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 modern equivalent asset valuation, which suggests to be replacement based. Um, NASA, is NASA going to, if it is going to, for the regulatory asset base, is NASA going to provide asset valuation warehousing or library to ensure that there is consistent valuation of similar or same assets across utilities? We need to get some clarity in terms of when we talk about uh, the way that average cost of capital, are we talking about real or nominal? You know, all those things need to be to be clarified. But just as a caution, as the EBP currently stands, policy position one, it prescribes the valuation methodology to be a replacement asset valuation. Um, again, um, if that position change remains after the policy has been reviewed, then the methodology will have to be consistent with that. It's tongue in cheek, Chairperson, is to say that stakeholders would prefer a surplus determination methodology because um, as publicly owned utilities, we don't, we are not profit driven, but rather a surplus. Talking about the, un the unbundling of value chain, the, the unbundling of ESCOM generation, and especially in the historic and horizontal context, power stations, for example, that is welcome and can even be implemented under the current methodology to enable ESCOM to more efficiently manage its generation cost and for it to actually be able to dispatch its plant on merit order, which can, um, which is something that is critical, but it can be done under the current methodology. There is a MERTA that uh, templates that ESCOM uh, normally has to comply with, um, uh, Full compliance with that, uh, that MERTA template would then end and, and help us to understand uh, unbundling of the operating cost. So in other words, we have existing tools that, that we can use more effectively to deal with um, those uh, issues around um, unbundling of cost. On data collection, for example, the methodology says it will be collected once in every, every five years, but at the same time, it, it says it will be reviewed on a yearly basis. Um, things that need to be clarified so that we have a clear understanding where we what we are talking about. 
they were to be used in cost assessment and conversion um, of course to tariffs suggested suggesting that NERSA will be setting the tariff for each individual municipality as I indicated earlier is NERSA asking the methodology to is the methodology suggesting that NERSA will start actively set tariff for individual municipalities um, meaning that NERSA may have to have to have offices um, everywhere in the country to be able to do that effectively. Um, um, we talks about converting the, the, the tariff determining on the nature of service described in section five of the document. But if you go to section five of the document, there's not much description. Maybe that description will still be coming um, in a further version of the document. But it also talks about individual tariffs can be set for expected life of the assets. Now, our assets on average have got a 50 year lifespan. Again, some clarity in terms of what we mean setting tariffs for the life of the asset. Um, but it says when it will be allowing for reopening um, when the situation changes. Uh, clarity in, in terms of how those it will impact on us. A fuel-based generation plant will be allowed to review tariffs to reflect frequency, um, uh, to reflect frequency in changes in price. For example, it says, "What does that mean for us as a um, customer of those um, um, of ESCOM that uses OCGTs um, to generate electricity, and of which the yes, ESCOM generation fleet uses different sources of fuel. For example, at a weighted average cost of say 94 cents a, a kilowatt hour." Is the methodology suggesting that when the diesel price changes once every month, that ESCOM will be allowed to increase the tariffs to say 110 cents? And how would that impact on, the, on municipalities as customers of ESCOMs? And what happens to our prices? What happens to price stability? And the MFA requirement that we may only increase prices once in a financial year. The license to, licenses to be required to submit business plans including narratives um, justifying cost. Um, again, going back to that expectation that seems to be there, that um, NASA's role will be changing um, in terms of the proposed methodology. NASA resource capability to analyze these intensive data requirements, uh, they, they not necessarily be fully defined at this point in time. It's still um, um, a question, it still leaves a question marks and there is no clear, clear proposed time frame in terms of full implementation of the def, um, implementation defined in the methodology in terms of how do we go about implementing this because we can't just switch from one effort to the other overnight. For example, the issue around um, load types, uh, cumulative load over time per customer will determine what the customer pays for power services. That's what the that's what the methodology suggests. Now that becomes complex, Chair, because City Power, for example, has got over 400,000 customers. Currently using I 20 different tariff um, categories. So the practical challenge in tariff determination per customer, it, it will be a challenge to see, oh, we are not very clear in terms of how we can determine tariffs per customer. And then it says output of principle two is load profile study. Now, if it's if principle two is to do a load profile study, um, would we implementation of the methodology when depending outcome of that study? Therefore, um, uh, not envisaged to be implemented um, as as um, in the subsequent financial year. There's a reference to payment for subsidy may be provided via social welfare services. I mean, that is not necessarily underpinned by any government policy right now. We are most entities, including ESCOM, many utilities around the world. There is an element of cross subsidization between residential customers and larger customers, for example. Now, um, if that benefit is taken away, there is no necessarily any social welfare a policy framework in place to substitute that effectively. So we are not very clear in terms of how it will impact on us. Industry subsidies will to be provided by relevant ministries, for example, it says. Again, 
not necessarily supported by clear government policy, except uh, uh, to say that certain industries right now have got some um, sort of protection and the other customers are paying for it right now. If it has to be taken away, how would it impact if there is no relevant policy framework from government, how will it impact on utilities? NASA analysis of data still to be incorporated in, into the methodology. Um, if NASA analysis still has to be incorporated, is this methodology document still work in progress or are we looking at implementing it while we are incorporating some of the findings? The weight of average tariff, um, does this suggest that the price charge to city bar will change on a daily basis? Um, the practical implication of um, weighted average per load type, if every customer, for every customer, because if, if every customer has got the element of each type of the load, how does this impact um, on tariff setting? Um, again, uh, the, the RIP the program may never be dispatched on a um, merit order and would not receive any revenue um, to be paid by means, and then will have to be compensated by means of levies. That's what the methodology, for example, suggests. Now, what we're thinking is the merit order system, it would be unfair to have a plan that should have been dispatched in terms of the, uh, to be displaced by uh, self-dispatch. That's what the methodology suggests. But um, in the reality is that self-dispatch plan um, is a take or pay contract. You either take it or you pay for it. So it, it is therefore cheaper to take it because you're going to pay for it anyway. When self-dispatch plans pla plant is um, generating and therefore to re reduce generation by other plant. So um, merit order dispatch actually dictates that self-dispatch must be dispatched as and when they are available. And that would be the cheapest form of, of dispatch because it is a take or pay. Price predictability cannot be achieved with, uh, with quarterly reviews and adjustments as suggested by paragraph um, 8.4 of the methodology. How do we review prices quarterly without adjusting consumer prices? It is not clear, Chairperson. Regarding um, positive load shifting of individual customers while the generation, generators generally respond to, to changes in the system load and not necessarily changes by individual customers. And that is because um, individual customer changing its, its, its load or demand can simply be replaced by another customer. And then the impact on the system would then be remain the same. So the, the um, generator generally respond to the um, system load requirements rather than individual customer requirements. And therefore they cannot be priced, uh, they are therefore ideally priced to um, offer system prices, meaning that um, in a market environment, uh, all the generators and customers get or pay the clearing price. There is no uh, price discrimination because um, the generator respond to the system requirement rather than individual customer requirements. In terms of the way forward, uh, um, is our view that while the electricity market um, requires fundamental market rules and procedures, it's it it is it is um electricity market is in a mode of self price discovery, so um, it then operates over the direct involvement of the regulator, at least in terms of price price setting. So when when you have a market, the role of the regulator is different um, and nothing to do with setting the price. In the absence of electricity market, the electricity supply industry has to be subjected to the traditional economic regulation as articulated um, by earlier speakers. The proposed methodology doesn't seem, does seem to be a combination of both market price discovery and traditional economic regulation, and may have to be refocused in line of the current national objective. The current methodology need not to be, the current, we may well have to, uh, the current MYPD methodology needs some improvement, for example, um, Think things like um, regulatory clearing account provision may have to be removed and to enable the utility to, to take um, more responsibility for the forecasting risk, or at least um, partly. Otherwise, Chairperson, as um, 
customers of ESCOM, we are also uh, utilities, but we take full responsibility for forecasting risk. Um, and um, if that has to be retained, it should be afforded to all players. But we, it's our view that it may have served its purpose and it, it's time that ESCOM takes responsibility for forecasting risk. And like any other business, ESCOM then has to respond accordingly. ESCOM cannot just be wanting to um, spend while there are no sales volumes. Um, and how does ESCOM do that? They simply go and pay the coal suppliers more for less coal. And that cannot be considered to be efficient and therefore not be rewarded through the regulatory clearing account. The non-performing plan that ESCOM has, 18, 15 to 18,000 megawatt, that's almost half ESCOM's fleet. It is not performing for years and end, but it is earning regulatory returns. And those are the improvements that the methodology needs to do um, uh, the, those are improvements that we can do through, through the current regulatory methodology rather than the wholesale change that seems to conflate uh, the roles of regulator in an unregulated environment or market environment versus a regulated environment. Having said that, uh, um, NASA should continue to be the active, uh, NASA is the only party um, in the scheme that can be an active advocate and lead the process of elect, um, electricity reform in the interest of future security of supply. Because if we don't do that, clearly ESCOM has no capacity to borrow anymore. They cannot, um, they may not be able to, on their own, um, meet our future security of supply requirements. Hence, we may need a market and NASA is best place to be the advocate for that. I thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hinda. Uh, you were right on time, um, uh, 20, 20 minutes. We really appreciate that. Uh, members, you have the City Power presentation before you. If you can engage with it, please. Um, if you can ask questions, clarity. Uh, Madam Masetti, you go first, ma'am. Thank you, Chairperson, and um, I'd like to thank um, Frank for the for the presentation as well. Um, Chairperson, I do have uh, maybe three or four questions to ask. Um, the from what uh, Mr. Hinda says is that um, it seems he's a bit uh, uncomfortable about the approach of uh, NERSA, um, uh, you know, affirming its legal mandate. Uh, that is in section 15 um, of the act where NERSA is empowered and is the only body and that is confirmed that has the legal mandate to set tariffs uh, for electricity in South Africa. I would like to understand um, why um, is it that um, you know city power has an issue with NERSA moving away from um, uh, just determining revenue and now NERSA complies with what the law requires of it to do in the way that it should intervene directly in the market by setting the tariffs. And why is that a problem if that is the prerogative of the regulator? And as, um, as it stated um, in section four, read with section 14 on the license conditions as well as section 15 in particular which states clearly that it must set the tariffs rates and prices and regulate revenue why is this a problem if i may be uh, clarified on that um the second question that i would like to understand and um, at least from city power is whether city power um, has a problem with the principle of allocating cost for the tariffs, cost that will now be based on the availability, the available capacity, as opposed to um, the, the the customer categories and the volumes uh, per those customers. Is it a problem for NERSA to consider that principle of now? Uh, um, uh, looking into available capacity as opposed to what is stated that, uh, well, we think that 
capacity will be available if we submit a production plan today as well as the corresponding EAF and later on all those things uh, don't materialize and now we have to change on a weekly basis depending on what is available before us and we can even change on a day-to-day -day basis depending on situations and if that now is being you know is, is such a changes and risk are, 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 are reduced and NERSA um, set the tariffs or the, uh, the cost associated to, with the tariffs on the basis of uh, available capacity. Do you have an issue with that? Um, the other thing that I would like to understand is um, whether City Power believes that NERSA is prevented from uh, addressing challenges that are facing the industry right now. And therefore, NERSA must postpone its direct intervention simply because there are other processes that are taking place of which NERSA has no control over those processes. But it is that the regulator that must be in a position to um, sort of curtail market power where it is manifested and be able to serve uh, to, to, to respond to the needs of the industry. And the industry entails consumers, suppliers, and other um, and, and participants in the industry. Should NASA postpone its role of uh, uh, responding to the needs and dealing with the challenges as, um, as, 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 as they are uh, happening? currently in the industry simply because there are other processes that are happening uh, elsewhere um, of which NERSA may at the right time because we nobody knows when such processes will uh, come to finality and there is nothing that prevents NERSA from you know adjusting its processes to make sure that there is consistency and harmony with any changes and measures that um, are contained in such processes when they are finalized. Is there anything that is fundamentally wrong with NERSA doing what it has to do within its powers? Um, can I also understand, maybe I must be clarified here, um, maybe that is how City Power assessed the impact of, uh, of, of the proposed um, uh, principles in the consultation paper and maybe then city power can clarify to us why does city power believe that um, it will be necessary for nersa to set offices in each province around south africa relate because um, uh, simply because of the um, um, changes that are being proposed why is is that so can you point us to the things that will necessitate such change um, that NERSA must now incur so much cost and have a presence in all nine provinces around the country. Maybe we missed something, and I would like to check if such significant financial implications on the implementation of the principles will actually uh, be uh, the outcome uh, of, the, of, of this process. Um, and then the other question that I would like to find out, in as much as City Power has an issue with the frequency of price reviews, can City Power then, uh, unlike pointing out just problems and what is not possible uh, to the industry, can City Power also suggest how best this can be done? How often should such price reviews be done? What is reasonable for the industry? Um, uh, for the review of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of prices in terms of the period, what will work? And lastly, Chairperson, the proposal that uh, maybe the refinement uh, in the current methodology could be that um, NERSA could do away with uh, the regulatory clearing account. If so, then what other mechanism must be put in place to be able to deal with variances that are inherent in any event when there are um, you know there are certain costs that 
the regulator must take into consideration because certain costs, you might know them at the time of the application, but it is uh, the, the type of uh, these applications are forward looking. So there will be cost that you cannot determine with accuracy. And that tells you that there is therefore an inherent possibility of over recovery as well as uh, perhaps under recovery. And how will therefore the regulator um, um, address such instances of over or under recovery if there is no mechanism of dealing with variances? That would be the last question, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Masetti. Uh, Mr. Kiza, your next, sir. Thanks, Chairperson. And uh, thanks to Mr. Hinda for the presentation. I uh, just got two questions, uh, very broad. Um, on, on slide five, I note the issue of the, or the, the concern about lack of clarity regarding the the rental asset base, uh, and and uh, there are also other elements listed in that slide, um, like uh, issue of the historic uh, cost uh, being used as a uh, for for asset valuation. I, I would like just to Mr. Hinder, maybe if you, you may not necessarily respond now. Uh, uh, Vapor, but maybe in, in, in your submission, your subsequent submission, just to talk to specifically to your preferences or, or, or what you think would be uh, the best approach um, because we are, we, are, we are consulting in primary for that purpose to get other people's views and, and, and also in admission of not having the monopoly of wisdom. On all these aspects, um, just your your preference um, uh, with regard to these concept of unavailable plans, whether it should be included or not included in the RAP to any return while not usable, and also your preferred asset valuation methodology or approach. Then, secondly, I'd just like to to know, in your view, uh, what must be uh, adjusted in the current methodology? For the unbundled ESCOM and and the and, and electricity market, particularly in view of how to to make a, a, to or to form an electricity market in the interest of future security of supply, like the, the last point that you got to in the, that is on slide six, but but now it, it also touches on the, on the last point of your way forward to say what 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 must exactly be be be, be, be tweaked. Or adjusted in in the MYPD to make it uh, uh, useful going forward, and also to use it to shape the the, the trajectory into where we, we envisage to be having an efficient uh, electricity market in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nkiza. Uh, Madam Pawasa, your comment. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Um, just to apologize as well. Um, I was struggling to to I was struggling to 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 connect yeah. earlier on when the meeting started, but eventually I got invited in. I've got a few questions for Mr. Hinder. Um, I just wanted to find out, you know, in slide three, he's mentioned the fact that it appears as though the the methodology is a work in progress and it's far from ready for implementation. I think um, he's mentioned that it needs further testing and collation of data or collection and collation of data. If you can just maybe, ex you know, explain to us what exactly does it needs to be done further in order to enhance the, the methodology as it is. Why is it um, not ready for implementation? If you can just unpack the statement. And also he had said, that NERSA wants to move from being a referee to a player, you know, when it wants to be involved in the process of tariff setting. As Ms. Masetti had said, that it's 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 a competency that is pre prescribed in leg in legislation. And so, if you can just tell us what exactly does it find um, irregular or 
not preferable for NERSA to be involved in the process of determination of tariffs and the setting of parameters thereof to say these are the parameters within which the tariffs can be determined. These are the consideration, the input costs, and a whole lot of things to be taken into account. So if you can just tell us what is it that he finds um, unacceptable with NERSA as an economic regulator doing that, you know, being involved in the process of determination of, of tariffs. And also just um, if you can just maybe explain to us further, what is his understanding of economic regulation and what role does he believe that NERSA should play in the determination of prices and tariffs so that maybe we'll be in a better position to appreciate the stance where he's coming from, the position that is given, you know, in the, as part of his presentation. Um, and then is in it, I think the last comment is with regard to the comment that he made that as the as NASA is moving from shifting from revenue determination to determination of tariffs, it will have to enhance uh, its staff complement to be able to address this. Maybe just explain in what way why is it necessary for NASA to now be. Because keeping in mind, we are the regulator. We are not necessarily an operator or a service provider in this instance. So why would there be a necessity for us to get more staff members on the ground to be able to fulfill the role of the regulator? Because we currently do have um, people within NARSA, officials within NARSA, who are involved in this process. So why would it be necessary for additional staff members and thus that will impact on the levies and a whole lot of things? If you can just explain that fact further. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Madam Pungwase. And apologies for earlier. I did see you did manage to join even in the previous in the with, with the first presenter, but I apologize that you you, you actually struggled in the beginning. But yeah, uh, no, I was actually I joined actually before they started presenting. So yeah. as you're opening is yes, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Apologies for the inconvenience, Chair. Sure. All right, Mr. Hinder, I've got, you know, the problem with coming last is that your questions have been asked by other people, but I have slight um, nuances to some of the questions. I know you know this, this, the Electricity Regulation Act backwards too. So I'm going to feed on to the questions asked by both Madame Masetti and also the Chairperson that maybe you know, maybe you could provide us with your interpretation of what you see as section 4A2 of the act, that is NASA must regulate. And it's a must, it's not a it's not a, a may, it's a NASA, the regulator must regulate prices and tariffs. And how that relates to the other sections under section 14, 14, 1, D and E, and also even in terms of section 15, that in setting or approving tariffs, the regulator must do certain things. But I mean, but you have a particular understanding. Maybe just share your understanding um, of why do you believe um, that if, or uh, your understanding of it, and also if you believe in giving effect to that, that then we are then shifting from being a referee to a player. Just kindly explain that for us. So I'm just adding, my colleagues have already asked that question, but I'm just giving a slight angle. Now, specific questions, though, um, is do you believe that we are the in, in terms of principle three, or rather in terms of um, determination of consumer prices, um, in terms of what has been proposed in the document, is it not clear that, or is it perhaps, you know, we, 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 may, we may think it is clear, but it may, may not be, that in, in, in respect of subsidies and surcharges, that the, the view is not that they should not be there, but that they should be transparent. That it should be understanding that in the case of those, when we are setting a particular consumer, uh, a, a price for the consumer, a particular group, that um, if that consumer group is paying a subsidy, it must be clear what that subsidy that it is paying must be clearly there. And if it's receiving, it must be clear. That's why plus or minus subsidy there. Is it not perhaps clear? Perhaps I guess it, it links very much to my overall uh, question to you. Is that perhaps, are you perhaps saying we may need further engagement on this so you get greater 
maybe for stakeholders to, to get greater clarity of what is actually being said. Maybe what you're saying, are you saying that, yes, you're reading something, but you're not necessarily fully comprehending what is actually being said. For instance, the issue of um, um, quarterly price reviews, in which case it is maybe indicated that those quarterly price reviews could go on to a slate such that every month, every year, or every quarter, for instance, there is an indication of the direction that the prices may change at the end of the year. And maybe when we're ready, might be 10 years down the line, that maybe those quarterly price changes can then be made in terms of tariffs, that is, um, or even in terms of consumer prices. Is, is that not apparent in terms of the document? Are you then maybe saying, look, let's engage further? Maybe, yeah, so if we can clarify that um, in terms of your understanding. Now, I know also you know the RCA methodology very, very well. Just wanted to come, I just wanted to your view on it. That in your view, for instance, um, is the issue, the primary issue with the RCA, is it the variation in costs or is it the variation in, in sales that is a problem? What is the issue in, in your understanding? The primary driver for the variations, is it the, the costs? I mean, clearly where you've got uh, any projections, uh, especially in terms of costs, you, you might not necessarily be correct, but is it the, the RCA problem inherently the issue of costs that may be changing and therefore affecting the predictability of the models or of the methodology? Or is it the primary impact the variation in sales. Um, so that is one question. Linked to some of the questions that have been asked by my members, um, and I, because I guess you understand the, 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 the methodology well. So when you're saying the, the current MYPD can be adjusted, firstly, you, you, you saw the presentation, the previous presentation by NOVA, that looked at the at MYPD as those three as those three separate steps. Is that your understanding of the MYPD, or is the MYPD in your case in your understanding as setting revenues um, um, uh, for for ESCO? Now, in the event that is the case that is about setting revenues, if the MYPD is about setting revenues for for ESCO, with the plants being retired, new players coming on board, and what have you, how do you see that? I mean, you make mention that you can make can be to adapt to the uh, to, uh, to make the, the changes that are happening to the sector. Um, I think your your last slide, you you were talking about there may be changes um, that may be happening to the, and, and and the MYPD can be changed to accommodate. But how do you do that? How do you accommodate the MYPD, which is primarily and maybe only solely about ESCOM revenues. But you've got other players. Are you seeing a situation where ESCOM stays as a single buyer in, an, in its unbundled fashion, uh, as it's unbundling now, and it's got nothing to do with the era, as it is unbundling right now, do you still see it as continuing as, as, as a single buyer and therefore, it's always about setting revenues for ESCOM. Or you said, or are you seeing these changes? But I'm, I'm just trying to understand because I understand you and understand this model very well. How do you see this? You've got a lot of private players that are coming on board, but you still continue just setting revenue for one player. Um, and 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 coming from City Power, as other people have said, well, if we were to apply the, the law 15.1. Um, 15 one properly is that if you are regulating revenue for one player then regulate revenue for all of for all players including all 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 municipalities is that what you are also saying that we should be regulating revenues for um uh for for, for municipalities so those are my questions uh, uh mr hinder but i think overall is one that says if if you can clarify do you require more maybe more engagement um, to clarify certain issues that may, may not be clear. 
As you know, you've got an opportunity to respond to those questions that you want to respond to on this platform, and but you have an option to then uh, supplement your responses within seven days um, um, uh, in, in writing. But over to you, Mr. Hilda. Uh, um, thank you, Chairperson. I will try to respond to a few of the questions. <clears throat> First, around setting of the tariffs and nurses' role. What, what it is only for me, it is only the starting to come out now in this version of the document compared to previous one in terms of how NERSA envisages to um, change its active role um, in the process of compliance with, the, with legislation. Now, in terms of setting tariffs, for example, and I, I have to be very quick if I, um, for example, Chair Besson, um, in, 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 in order for NERSA to, right now what is happening is in order for NERSA to be able to execute its responsibility in terms of the act, um, there is a role played by the utilities, there is a role played by NERSA officials in terms of coming to a set of tariffs that get approved for NERSA, I mean for a utility. Let's take ESCOM for example, um, and the, the, the proposed methodology also underpins revenue requirements. So we go through that exercise. At some point, the function then gets transferred to NERSA, I mean, to ESCOM for it to set, um, um, to do the, the other steps and then come with proposed sets of tariffs to NERSA. And then NERSA says, um, compares to the previous ones and approves and say, and it eventually NERSA signs off the set of tariffs. But in so doing, it relied on capability within the utility as well as within, within NERSA. The proposed one seems to say utilities will come with a budget and give it to NERSA. NERSA will have to then deploy its own resources in terms of rate setting and determining the tariffs eventually. And going to the question of capacity, it then means that um, a municipality somewhere in the Eastern Cape, um, for them to be able to do when they will have to be a back and forth between NERSA and, uh, and the municipality. And the effect, the extent to which NERSA can do that with one person sitting in Johannesburg or Pretoria, dealing with 15 municipalities, which each municipality has got a couple of resources that they employ to be able to uh, 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 present tariffs, propose tariffs to NERSA. Now, if NERSA has to take, an, take over that function, it may have to require simply more people, and it may have to require resources um, closer to where they are required. Um, to be able to effectively interface um, with, with people because some of that responsibility right now is executed at the um, at, by, by utilities for NERSA. But if NERSA wants to take over all those things, then, I mean, look at the, the resources ESCOM has just around its tariff setting process. Those resources will have to be duplicated in NERSA if that function goes over to NERSA in executing its responsibility does not uh, delegate some of the things to the utilities. But that's really what we are saying. And, and again, what we are asking is for just clarity to say, if that's what NERSA is um, suggesting, then it should come out strongly in the document and not just be some way um, by, by the way. In terms of work in progress, if I look at this slide, for example, it talks about a um, set of basic rules for uh, permissible revenue. It talks about um, rules for setting rates and it rules for alternate, alternating tariffs between, but it just talks about rules. There is no set of rules that says, this is how um, rules for setting tariffs, it just says they must be clear and be communicated to licensee. That's where the methodology ends. So we agree this must be clear and communicated to the licensee, but what are they? Um, that's the completeness that we are, are talking about. Maybe on the market and the availability of capacity, again, the, um, in a regulated environment, utility like ESCOM commits to say, I have got 48,000 uh, megawatt available capacity to meet the demand. That's what they say during the process of applying for a certain set of tariffs. The next day after, immediately after approval, ESCOM then puts up something to say 15 to 20,000 megawatt is not available. But this 15 to 20,000 megawatt is in the rate base. So it's a matter that we need to balance that. So um, if somebody says it's available, then they have to take responsibility 
for its availability. Otherwise, uh, if that 15 to 20,000 megawatt was not available, the NERSA wouldn't need to allow ESCOM so much for coal because we do need to run the coal plant. But, but and that's what we are trying to say around it. Talking about the market, Chairperson, we are saying the future is the market. But in a market environment, there is no role for a regulator in terms of price setting. Maybe in terms of market rules and so on, the market takes care of itself when, when it comes to pricing. In a regulated environment, there is a particular approach that we well established um, um, in terms of how we follow setting rates for a regulated environment. But we cannot mix up the two. Um, and we can't have a situation where every three months we change set the rate settings. Everywhere where it's regulated in the world, tariffs are set at least at least once a year. Um, some cases it's set for multiple years, but it can have a situation where tariffs are changing willy-nilly, and then we're saying it's um, price stability. About the RCA, um, for example, Chair, the issue is not so much a regulatory clearing account because it's also a well-established concept, but the way it's implemented, there is an element of abuse in it. Right now, it looks like almost everything, that every cost element of ESCOM is allowed for regulatory clearing, and it cannot be, it cannot be like, uh, like that. Um, from history, for a very long time, ESCOM used to simply overestimate the volumes compared to actual volumes that are realized six months before uh, the, the next one is implemented. So, so it has got that history of simply overestimating volumes. And also when it comes to cost management, um, ESCOM would apply to um, 150,000 tons of coal at, at 400 and a ton, for example. They only end up, because they don't run coal, they end up only buying 100,000 tons. But they still pay the same price for the 100,000 that they would have paid for 150. There is manipulation somewhere there, potentially. And those are the things. So it's the extent to which the regulatory clearing account has been abused that is really a, a, a concern. And any utility somewhere, any company that runs on volumes, if the volumes drop, you, you cannot go on with, with, with your cost as though nothing has happened. And that seems to be how um, the regulatory clearing background is, is being implemented um, right now, Chair. I don't know whether I still have more time, Chair Um Look, I, I could give you three minutes so we can start with the next presentation at quarter two. But if you choose to actually respond in writing, we'll really appreciate that as well, so that for the record, we actually have got your answers in writing. That would be appreciated as well. Okay, I think, yeah, let me stop the chairman, and the rest will be in writing. All right, um, thank you, you've got seven days, as we know it. On behalf of NASA, we'd like to thank you, we'd like to thank you for your input, and um, if you really, it's about further engagements, uh, our doors are open, uh, Mr. Hinda. Um, we do need to, we, we will probably need to engage further to clarify certain things, if that is what is required. Um, I'd like to thank you on behalf of, of NASA for your presentation. And you can now unshare your slide. Thank you. We are now going to move to the last presenter of the day. Uh, Mr. Lamini, it is still the last presenter, correct? Mr. Uh, Rajay Mudele, representing Port, Port Elizabeth. Uh, I'm sorry, but yes, Mr. Kubet. Mr. Mkiza, your hand is still up. I assume it's a, it's a legacy hand. I, I, I apologize if it wasn't. Um, all right, great. So um, we are now going to go to the last presenter of the day, Mr. Rajan Mudle. And, um, and uh, you were, I think I was just seeing your face and then it disappeared. If you can show your face again, sir. And then uh, thank you. And we can swell you in. Firstly, you do not have any objections to taking an oath or, a, or an affirmation? Um, if you can put your mic, um, put your mic on as well. We are, we are on mute. You can unmute yourself. Thank you. You are now unmuted. Right. Um, so, under raise your right hand and affirm the following. Do you solemnly declare that the evidence or the information that you are going to give to this panel is the truth and the whole truth as you know it? I do. Thank you. For the record, please state your name, uh, the, uh, the entity you are representing, 
and your designation in it, please. OK, good morning or good afternoon to everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Raju Murli. I don't represent an entity, as I said in my um, application to be here. I'm, a, I'm a, in my capacity as a private um, householder um, doing a presentation on behalf of myself and, and, and my household. Uh, I know Relax. you said I represent Kabeha. I'm not here. I don't want the mayor of Kabeha to claim that I'm a usurping. Um, we're losing you there a little bit. Connectivity challenges. Okay. Yeah. We, lo we, we lost you there for a moment. I think there was a, a bit of a connection challenge. Um, which will yes. probably improve as we as we switch off our videos. But no, no, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that clarity. Um, in fact, we are most welcomed. We're not just looking at. Uh, we're actually welcome uh, the, the demand um, the demand sector representing coming and making presentations. Yeah, um, so you've got twenty minutes to make your input. Um, are you making Can a I presentation? Video off because that will improve the sound quality, and then we can put it on again when you want me to put it on. No, no, no. You can switch off your, your video now completely. It's it's uh, our, okay. our only we only did that for the uh, for, for the swearing in. Are you right. are you making a, a PowerPoint presentation or are you providing? No, sir. This is content? an oral an oral presentation. All right. You've got twenty minutes, sir. If you can, and your okay. twenty minutes will start now. Thank you. Okay. You you sound like somebody on on Master Chef, but anyway, that's right. Um. I want to I want to put my video on just, just for the beginning part. I want I want you to see something. I'm, I hope you can tell me that you can see it uh, on the screen. Yes, uh, we I can see your prepaid meter, your your, your prepaid your, your bill. Yes. Thank you. On on this document that I'm showing you on my screen, sir. This is from the 15th of November, 2004. Okay. On that day, I purchased electricity for 300 rands and I received 824.9 kilowatts on the 15th of November 2004. On the 1st of August this year, I paid for a thousand rands and I got 403 kilowatts. You can see it's almost a complete reversal. Now I'm, I'm doing this presentation. I know this whole thing is about is about NERSA's role as, as a regulator in the whole process. But, but I'm trying to in, um, give you an insight into, as a consumer, what, what are we faced with given, given the whole issue of electricity in, in South Africa? And I know, I know I've been listening to everybody's input. I didn't just come in for, for my presentation. And, and I sincerely believe that there's still a role and a bigger role in this country, especially for a regulator to play. For me, it's not merely a question of supply and demand and market driven forces that uh, Mr. Mundi, we lost you there for a moment again. Uh, and yeah. and market driven forces that determines um, the cost and the price and everything to do with electricity. I'm firmly of your view that there needs to be some form of regulatory framework and there needs to be a regulator in place to ensure that that prices don't go through the roof and and so forth. We we're not in a we're not in a perfect world and therefore things need to need to still be very highly highly regulated. Now I, I'm going to give you my insight as to why I'm saying that and why I believe there needs to be this kind of, of regulatory framework. We all we all are fully aware of the problems that that ESCOM as the as the supplier is facing, has faced, and has, and has told us as the as the consuming republic what they must deal with. We've heard a lot of testimony um, from about corruption and capture and 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 all of those things that have dumped ESCOM into the current situation that they are faced with and their huge debt burden that they need to service currently. But be that as it may, we must also understand that you cannot make the consumer pay 
for mistakes that you as an entity have made or that you have allowed to happen in your entity over a long period of time. And when one reads now the, the new document that ESCOM has released recently, 120 odd pages long, about how they want to now come up with new ways of recovering their costs and charging consumers for electricity, it's merely for me a way for them to cover up or to recuperate their losses, which they've allowed to happen over a over this long period of time that we that we all talk about. And and it cannot happen when they talk of time of use tariffs and all of these things. It just cannot happen because if if they want to put in, for example, that that fixed tariff that they want to charge consumers or some of the consumers, it's going to mean that they are going to have to drop the price, the unit price of electricity by up to 63 percent. And that's, we know that's not going to happen so that people pay the same that they are paying today or even less as they claim people maybe end up paying a couple of grand less. ESCOM has also told us periodically of their problems being related to the theft of diesel, people putting rocks in the coal to cause breakdowns and therefore to be forced to get maintenance contracts and sabotage. But up until today, we haven't heard of a single person that has been charged let alone prosecuted for these so-called crimes. And things go on and on and on. And as, as consumers, we, we cannot be left with the burden of allowing ESCOM or other providers as they come on board now within, within the new setup to merely set prices that will, that will uh, make it more difficult for people to afford electricity. And we all know you, you cannot live without electricity. Because with the new setup that they are proposing, even if you don't use electricity, you are still going to pay. So, so whether you have a whole set of um, panels on your roof and, uh, and, and have batteries and have inverters, you're still going to be paying ESCOM some fee at the end of the day. I, I want to just add something further. We need to look at the whole question of, of electricity. And, and, and regulating it, but I, I believe we need to be holistic in our viewpoint here. Because as where I'm sitting, I don't buy electricity directly from ESCOM. I buy it from my local municipality, as do most people in, in this country, right? But what we find is ESCOM com continuously complains that municipalities owe them a huge sum of money. And we all know that is true. So the question is, why is that being allowed to happen? And now ESCOM wants to recover those losses from us and from and from other consumers. And it's simply because we're sitting with a whole host of municipalities or the majority of our, of our municipalities, which are dysfunctional. They are, cons they are charging their consumers for electricity. They're buying it from ESCOM, but then they're not paying ESCOM the money because they're using, they're using the bulk of that funding to service their, their, their salary and benefits bill and some of the operational costs. Now, as a regulator, we, you, you also need to take that into account to say, hang on, the, 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 the consumer cannot be made to suffer at the hands of all of these entities in, in the supply chain of electricity because of, of gross inefficiencies, and 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 uh, inabilities to manage and 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 a and be forthright with what you come up with. I don't want to go much further. I didn't have a presentation to put. I just wanted to get those viewpoints across. Uh, I know I haven't taken up 20 minutes. It might only have been five minutes of your time, but that's fine for me. I've, I've said what I wanted to say. Thank you, Mr. Mudley. Um, it is a challenge that, unfortunately, the, the, the challenges that come with this with this platform is that uh, the connectivity, sometimes uh, um, we lose connectivity. So there, there were times in your presentation when we actually missed you for a couple of seconds but i think yes. um, whereas the members we did hear the gist of what you were saying and we would really appreciate it by the way if 
if you have if you have maybe the points that we are raising in writing, if you could also just email it, email the points um, to. No, I, I will definitely do that. Um, just that you know, I, I I didn't know until just before nine o'clock this morning that I was actually going to be doing this presentation because I didn't receive anything. So, um, but but I will do that. I will put together something uh, more substantial in writing containing exactly what I said, and I will send it. We we'll really appreciate that, in, in, including those attachments. Uh, it would be interesting to see your bill uh, for, for, yeah, yeah, your, your, your 2004 <laughs> bill compared to your 2022 bill. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, members, there is the presentation by a consumer. Um, if you can engage with the, with, the, with, with the presenter, please. To the extent to which you have questions of clarity or any or, or comments or anything that you may want to say. Um, Madam Pungose, you can call Madam. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Just to thank uh, Mr. Modlier um, on his presentation. And I think the point that he uh, I had coming in the main from his presentation was the fact that the inefficiencies incurred and the losses, you know, that was that have been incurred by ESCOM as a result of its corruption that was pu widely publicized and poor management of facilities should not somehow result in, in that impacting negatively on the tariffs that are charged by consumers. Or it doesn't it should not end in consumers funding that. So if maybe Mr. Modler can explain, um, does he think the MI, MYPD Will will in a way maybe ensure that consumers are charged prudently and efficiently incurred costs in the provision of service. Does he believe that it will be in a way in in a position to address that aspect of his concern? Thank you, Chair. That's all from me. Thank you, Madam. Um, Mr. Mkiza, question from you, sir. Uh, thanks, uh, Chairperson, and thanks to Mr. Mudley for the presentation. Uh, I was um, listening. I just want to make sure that I understood him correctly. If we can just uh, talk to that issue as to whether uh, he, 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 the, the message across so to bring across is that uh, irrespective of the, the methodology, there are some external factors that need to be dealt with amongst which are the uh, municipalities that uh, are still owing ESCOM huge amounts of money uh, and, and, and other issues related to uh, corruption, mismanagement, etc., that needs to be dealt with, uh, that will, will kind of undermine whatever methodology one may seek to, to bring to the fore. Just want to, to, into, just to, to confirm if that is my understanding. And then um, two, is I would uh, invite him if there are any specific issues that talk to the methodology itself that he wants to put forward to, 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 to do so in writing within the next seven days so that you can enrich now the methodology itself and not necessarily uh, look at the bigger environment outside of the methodology. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nkiza. Uh, Mr. Mudley, um you there you go sir uh, if you can respond to the questions posed by members okay then i'm going to start from from the bottom up if you don't mind because That's it's fine. easier Thank you. um yes, yes I, I will i will i will in my in my in a written submission also respond in, in more detail to the to the document on the methodology so that you at least have my my viewpoints on that um that's the one thing and yes uh, the gentleman is correct when he when 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 he says I am referring to other issues. That's why I said we need to have a more holistic uh, uh, approach to applying the methodology, first of all, because there are, there are other issues with, which would come up. And, and, and one not only looks at, um, at the question of dysfunctional municipalities, you also hear uh, the CEO of ESCOM refer to poor decision making and poor policy making and and one needs to understand what were those decisions that were that were so poorly made and what are those policies that were so poorly implemented because that will in my view 
impact upon their request to you in future for, for tariff increases? And, and one needs to be aware of those things because you can't, you can't just allege that there were poor decision making, but you don't say what were the decisions that were made poorly and who were the people that, that made those poor decisions. And secondly, you can't go and talk about poor policy making when you don't outline what were the policies that were made, um, you know, for whatever reason, and and what was the impact of those of that poor policy policy making. On the first question, yes, ma'am, I do I do agree that um, when you talk of your MYPD, that that the things that I mentioned um, will be captured. And, and, and should be dealt with in, in, in the MYPD to ensure that the consumers are, are protected and, and not uh, left at the mercy of whether it's ESCOM or any other provider that comes into, into the space, uh, given, given the announcement by the president, that we are protected by, by the provisions within, within your methodology so that uh, um, fairness is, is maintained throughout. Thank you. We'd like to thank you, uh, Mr. Mudley, and um, and also just to also just to extend the this invitation that says if you can within seven days, um, uh, please do provide. And also maybe in the future we may be able to now that we've got your contact, we'll be able to invite you to any future engagements um, that we may have. And um, I I think there will be many that will follow. So on behalf of um, of NASA, we'd like to thank you for your input. Thank you, sir. No, thank you, sir. And and I, I will participate wherever I can and, and I will be responding with within the next few days. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank um you. thank you. Um um colleagues, this brings us to the end of the of the public hearings on the new methodology. Um so I just thought I'll just uh, close with just a couple of comments and maybe a bit of direction also going forward. So that simple says um for me from where I'm sitting is quite clear that um, the, although the, what, what is being, what is on the table for changing is the MYPD, the multi-year pricing determination as pertaining to ESCOM, is that some of the comments that were made were actually made in response of the, of the total um, um, pricing system, which I guess in respect of what is being proposed in moving from regulating revenues the proposal to regulating tariffs and prices as mandated by the law um, is that clearly it then changes the, the landscape. That is not just about um, setting revenues for, for ESCOM, therefore NASA in effect regulating revenues rather than regulating tariffs. That the, there's a, a bit of a conflation and some of the comments that are made come from that. And that we need, as we're going forward, to clarify that. But from the comments for me, I just wanted to say, it seems to me that there are two schools of thoughts that are emerging. And which schools of thought NASA needs to take into account as decisions are being made. The first school of thought from where I'm sitting is one that simply says, Yes, we understand that the, the current methodology has not worked, has not worked as well, but don't throw the baby with the bathwater. Continue with the status quo. Continue setting ESCOM revenues. And maybe even continue to then allow ESCOM to, based on its cost of supply studies or whatever, to then determine uh, to set its tariff structures, retail tariff structures, and and basically um, set its retail tariffs and then they come back to you for, for approving those. That's the proposal, I think, that I'm seeing some members are saying that continue with the status quo. But I, I think in so doing, if we are following the court cases, there's also the issue that then says, well, in so doing, if you're being fair, you might have to extend this this revenue regulation to municipalities, to other municipalities. Don't just do this, set the revenues only for ESCOM. Then it then, then it just raises questions that then say, okay, well, what about the em emerging private players? How do you deal with those? Well, it seems to say, 
the only way that they can recoup um, their revenues, the private players, is to continue then to sell to ESCOM as a single buy. Then it then raises the issue that says, okay, what about me as the consumer? Well, as was presented by uh, some of the consumers, including, I guess, uh, the big user groups, energy intensive user groups and, 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 the, and the mining council, no, 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 continue doing what, what we are doing to us. Um, we appreciate that the, the cost of sub, uh, the, the time of use tariff supply to us, they may not apply to, uh, to, 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 to residential consumers and, and commercial consumers and maybe even the, uh, the agricultural sector, but we are quite happy with that. Um, let's continue with that, but perhaps just make a few changes in terms of how you ensure that the costs that are presented by ESCOM, that they are checked properly for prudency and so forth. But in sense, just keep the status quo. That's what I read. That is the first school of thought. The other school of thought that I'm them reading is one that says, well, we recognize that we cannot continue just regulating ESCOM. Um, and, and regulating revenues for ESCOM. That we recognize that. And that there is a need for change. But with that change, you need to make the change taking into account that there are other changes um, that are actually happening in the industry, including the amendment of the Electricity Regulation Act and the associated electricity pricing policy. But we recognize that there is a need for change. And maybe even recognizing that, in fact, your mandate, Mr. Regulator, was to regulate prices and tariffs. You may not have done that in the past. You may have regulated ESCOM revenues, but perhaps we need to regulate um, prices and tariffs. However, in doing so, we need to have a proper documentation 